in the coming election, we have a choice. It is an opportunity to decide our future, especially as young people, and vote candidates that would fund the education system. And now, we have a choice also as young people. We could fold our arms and continue to watch the rotting system, but we can also take positive actions to make a difference. We can be on the front line for literacy campaign by ensuring that no child should be left out of school because his or her parents do not have the money. Young people should not run away from Nigeria to other countries. Well, I am in the United States and I hope I am not back very soon. The task before all of us gathered here today is to make this country work. The future of this country is in our hands, especially as young people. I am today using this opportunity and this platform to appeal to the governments of my country, the federal governments of Nigeria, and all the governments of all levels to ensure full implementation of the Child Rights Act by ensuring that no child is left out of the school. I can assure you that if we develop our education system, Nigeria has the abundant human resources to make this country great. With an improved education system, our young people can compete favorably anywhere in the world. We can meet with all the goals together. You can choose that future for Nigeria as young people. In the words of my beloved bishop, Professor Godfrey Honor, there is always company in misery. Nothing unites human beings like suffering. The present government has united us in suffering, and if you're still thinking about political parties or religion or ethnic group, it will shock you. That was what my bishop said some time ago. At this point, our call for action at Voice Champions is for political participation, especially for young people. To vote character and, and confidence instead of party or tribal affiliation. United in suffering, it is time to send our bad leaders packing. We as responsible citizens need to rededicate ourselves to, the nation, to nation building. Those of us who believe that government should be a force for good should work harder than anyone. This is what the election comes down to. This is the choice we all make to raise our voices as young people. While we insist on personal responsibility, we should also recognize individual initiatives. My fellow young people, you are the change. You are the future, and that future is today. That future is now. This is not a time to withdraw from our agitation for a better Nigeria. This is not a time also to fold our hands and watch our leaders continue to ruin our country and our future. No one puts his hands on the plow and turns back who is worthy of the kingdom. We must not look back at the empty promises of our bad leaders who have left us in the law for decades. Make your choice ahead. Together, we will move our country forward. To shape the future of our country and our continent is a task before all of us. We are all invited to join the crusade for a better Nigeria. We must not try, we must not be silent in any season, but encourage other youths to form a formidable network to change the Nigerian story. And this is why this event is very important. At Boys Champions, we're changing narratives and we're also changing lives. I am so proud of what we have achieved together. As I stand here this morning, I've never been more hopeful about our work at Boys Champions as I am. I understand that the challenges are many, but our faith remains really strong. I am hopeful because of you all. This is a very important announcement, and I would like to say it before all of us. I am excited about 10 of our young boys who will have an opportunity to go on an exchange program in the United States next year that will be fully funded by the Boys Champions and the AFS Intercultural Program in the U.S. 10 of our young boys who are part of our programs at Boys Champions. And this is the change that we're bringing. This is the intercultural experience that we want to bring into our country. 
I am hopeful because we have created a platform that will, will redirect our youth, increase their productivity, reinvigorate their entrepreneurial spirit. Through our organization, I have seen lots of youth creating opportunity within the communities and not anchoring their hopes on deadly trips through the desert to Europe. Some Nigerians have distinguished themselves as role models by their integrity, character, sacrifice, and selfless services to the nation. We have also worked hard to identify these people who are leading in different areas of their lives, either in businesses, in leadership, public service, and even in their different communities. And we should all try to reward excellence, especially individual initiatives. So let me quickly congratulate uh, Mr. Peter Obi, who is the winner of our Shaping the Future conference, um, for keeping the faith in Nigeria and for demonstrating the political will to address the challenges faced by this country. We also have the Helmut Schuster Leadership Award, which is dedicated to Dr. Helmut Schuster, who is um, the director and the founder of Evocla Energy in the UK. Um, through him, he has actually committed $10,000 to recognize one young person who is part of our project here in Nigeria. And that is to support uh, an initiative that they, that young person is actually doing. And to let you know, this is going to run all through the year as, as much as um, Dr. Schuster remains alive. So we are very grateful to him. I will say more regarding the award. So but please put your hands together for him. So we're very grateful to Dr. Schuster for um, deciding to give that award to one Nigerian young person. Dr. Schuster was supposed to be here and some other people, but just three days ago, um, their organization insisted that they cannot travel to Nigeria because of the level four amber alas that was released by the United States Embassy. So um, just let us bear with him, if not, he was supposed to award this by himself. So we also have, um, the Joseph Werby Best Teacher Prize for Africa. We have decided to also recognize um, a teacher who works in a rural community in Nigeria who is making incredible impact in rural communities and in the lives of young people, especially young students. And we are going to also announce that award later on during the day. So, uh, for this relentless advocacy for peace and social justice, we also have the Boys Champions Peace Award that will be presented today to Cardinal John for Nikon. And I congratulate all the awardees for this well-deserved honor. We thank them for all their contributions to making life beautiful for our dear country and for making great impacts in the lives of all well-meaning Nigerians. Our target of Boys Champions is to reach 50,000 young people in the next five years by providing mentorship sessions, skill acquisitions, and reorientation programs that we offer in our, in our organization. The success of this project, no doubt, is dependent on the availability of resources, which we are very grateful to all our partners and those who have supported us greatly. As a non-profit non, non organization, we do not rely so much on you know, support and all that, because we're also working so hard to create an internally generated revenue. And that's why one of my companies, which I started about four years ago, has been at the forefront of you know, funding all our activities. I can assure you that we receive little or no um, support from external bodies, but, you know, so everything that we've, we've used to put this together was generated by that small company that I started four years ago. And this is also my advice to other young leaders who want to make change. Before you make change, before you begin a non-profit, do not hold, you know, do not hold people giving you the fund to run your project. Think of something that is sustainable. Think of something that you have to begin first of all that will power your organizations. Because if you rely on funding coming from individuals, that means you may not be able to carry out your activities if you do not have this funding. And it is not sustainable anymore. So it is a structure that we have built as Boys Champions. And we're happy that we're making great impact. The task before all of us is to make the right decision and never to be part of the problem that has befallen Nigeria. And this is why we started shaping the future.
I urge my fellow Nigerian youth to desist from lawlessness and restiveness. We must tread the path of peace and remain vanguards of peace in our communities. We must be gender sensitive and accord due respect to our women and girls. This is what we teach our young boys and girls. Hand in hand, we must end violence against women and girls. Hand in hand also, we will take the message of ending gender-based violence from neighbors to neighbors and from door to door. As the political activities gear, gear up in Nigeria, we must get involved and work together for the rebirth of our fatherland. The journey may be quite long, but we must be ready to pay the price. Thank you very much, and let's continue to shape the future together. Thank you. Me thinks he deserves another round of applause. You know, when Jesus was walking here, they were saying, Is it not the son of the carpenter? And I'm tempted to say, Is it not the son of God the Armona, just the other day from my village? And his prowess is alarming. His words are wonderful. And he says it's the education that prompted him this far. It's a round of applause for the young man. He has asked us and asked the government to make use, good use of young people. Because according to him, there are people who are here who could be more potentially gifted than he is. And we must harness all these people. Thank you, Noel. Thank you so much. And, and I came from the same village. Why am I not so blessed as it is? That should work hard. Honestly, I must work hard to be better. Thank you so much. Indeed. We are going to progress and make it fast in you. Let me welcome Roya Montasa. A round of applause for her. says a change will come when each one of us has the courage to question our fundamental beliefs and values. Am I right? Give a round of applause for that. It's nice to see you. You say your identity is superpower. I have tried to see who you are, but I am I'm very I now get the reason why you are included in this shaping the future conference. Welcome her with a rousing round of applause and thank you so much for being here in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to begin and ask for keynote addresses. May I plead with my father bishop that we shall take something before you come on, as it is specified by the order of events. We are going to take something from Dr. Morin Morning. Dr. Maureen Manning is going to talk to us through audiovisual elements. And uh, they are getting ready to see Shaping the Visual Conference 2022. The Dr. Maureen Manning is a regular on the conference circuit and she's an international consultant, presenter to keynote occasions and the speaker on all things that will encourage the young people to become better. If we are ready up there, may we now take the words of Dr. Maureen Money. Even if she's not here, can we give a round of applause before she takes over? Thank you so much. Thank you. If they are not ready, then I will plead with my father bishop to begin this uh, event. Okay, just suspend it and make sure you get ready immediately after. Let me request my Lord Bishop, Father Bishop, to take, are you ready? Would you mind, Father Bishop? All right. Let's take from Dr. Maury Maureen. Thank you. going to allow this opportunity of talking to young people 
to come down to us through my father bishop professor godfrey Godike honor thank you he don't speak in latin don't speak in japan longer conscious of my own age and since they say age is in the mind it then begins also to reflect in the body the general you see here retired from the army from the army a number of years ago but if you see him every morning doing his morning workouts you think he is just in his teens it is this constancy this presence this love for young people and their uh, things, that is what I think sustains some of us, even as we continue to age physically. You can't change biology. Anyway, having said that, I'm impressed, very impressed. And that is the risk you also always have when you don't have written texts. The first thing I have to say about this shaping the future is that if you remember, I got into trouble with the federal government and its security apparatus in 2020, in October, because I said that was I said that the youth and youths of this country have endured too much. And for over 50 years, we have been hearing that the youths are the leader of the future. And the people who said that 50 years are still leading, 50 years ago, are still leading. And they are not ready to go away. And I advised young people, don't wait for us to go away. We won't. You have to find a way of showing us the door without violence. Anybody, Anybody who knows me knows we know that I am allergic to violence, but I am open to change without violence. And as if to take the word from me, just yesterday, I got a clip of some with the background music of Pelas International TV. They showed several leaders of this country whom they tagged permanent Nigerian youths. People have refused to admit their age and get out of the way. 
I am closely associated with universities in this country. One is in this state, as the chairman of the governing council and pro chancellor of the issues, Enugu State University of Science and Technology. Recently, we discovered a professor who got his first school living certificate when he was a one year old. Because he had changed his age of birth to the point that he got his first school living certificate at the age of one. That is the reality, and that is why many of you are where you are today. Because older logs are occupying the space. And incidentally, you are encouraged this continuity by your own teachers. The youths are not leaders of tomorrow, they are leaders of today. This is my input. I will give an example. In Nigeria, officially they say youth ends at 35. But in Nigeria, we could extend it to 45. Now let us say, if everybody who is 45 and above in this country were to sit at home, do, do nothing, nothing for 24 hours, we will feel the impact. But not as much as if everybody who, are, who is below 45 in this country were to do nothing for 24 hours. No telephone calls, no ticket drivers, no escort, no Okada, no students, nobody to fetch water for anybody, nobody to clean anybody's shoes or wash anybody's clothes. But you are controlling the machine of the movement of this country that we have. That is just what I want to remind you of. And you have to tell your story while looking, yes, at the elders, those of them who are still models, and there are a good number of them. Beginning from you. There is nobody among those of us here, at least now, who got to where he is through connections of parental privilege. My father was a classroom teacher. Cardinal John and I can say I'm lucky because his father was a farmer. General Lazy's farmer, my father was a taxi driver. And he did not get into the army by quota system. And very often, young people in Nigeria now fold their hands and wait for somebody to drop possibilities and opportunities on their lives. I sit in my office as bishop and mothers, fathers, come weeping that I should help their children find a job. And I ask them, where is your child? And the job you are doing was your father who found that job for you or your mother. Why would your son be sitting at home watching Manchester United and you are here looking for a job for him? I'm sorry I don't have a job, but if I had, I wouldn't give it to the likes of your son. And often when young people come tell you to empower them, they just mean give me money. I'm happy that Noel, you guys are distracting this man who came from America to listen to some of these ideas. I'm happy that the way you structure this conversation, education comes first. Education comes first. Check all the models of transformation you have in the world. In recent history, Japan, India, China, Singapore, they were all education based, education driven. And that is why dictatorships throughout the world, and especially in Nigeria, don't mind whether they call it democracy or anything. 
dictatorships are always afraid of education. And they make sure they don't fund education. Because they know the greatest empowerment young people will get is education. And, but I'm happy. I'm happy because that, is that education now is even moving into an area where young people are in control. Information communication and communication technologies. Young people are in control. And this is where much of the information that many of you have now comes. But the question is, what is the content you are putting in there and the content you are consuming in this country? Positive content or negative content? The choice is yours. If it, is, if it had become possible for COVID to force the world, to invest in online university and secondary and primary education, thereby making you use your smartphones and laptops to study from home, it is left to you to decide what you do when you turn on your gadgets at home, where nobody is controlling you. Because this instrument of education is now in your own hands. And Nigerian youth, you must make a choice in this regard. I also think that it must be a value-based and skill acquisition education. It must be an education that trains people in skills and offers values. Not just a system of education that provides theoretical information. We are fond of criticizing past generations. Nigerians and Africans in general will always blame the colonial masters and missionaries for the system of education that we have in our country today. I find that ridiculous. Because the colonial masters and missionaries needed clerks and catechists. And they trained people to do the work that they wanted. We are the ones to identify our needs and tailor our educational system to solve our problems. When you find a system where we are constantly depending on models and solutions provided by our ancestors and applying them to problems we no longer have. I've never seen the people so culturally lazy. I'll give you other examples. What we call culture, all the cultural practices, all those masquerades and practices you are playing on to in the name of our culture, including your system of dress. There were solutions that our forefathers provided for the problems they had social practical solutions and based on the limited knowledge of the universe and environment that they had and now we our situation has changed our problems are new and we are insisting on applying their solutions to our problems you don't eat food with cutlery because it is against your culture your forefather did not have cutlery for heaven's sake. <laughs> you are carrying two, three smartphones. And yet you think the only way to solve your technological problem is to conduct a DPR in any way. <laughs> and the art and science of rain making and rain control that they devise our engineers and technologists have been unable to codify that science and art so that we surround it with mystery and it looks like all. What is more? Before contact with Europeans, our people had looms that produced cloth. But those looms produced cloth that was very short and very narrow. 
So they would tie that piece of cloth around them, and that was all their clothing. Amara kwa nuku, sauce of kwa kwa, opriya kona wine yigarapa, makanwe mero so. There was no other. The story is told, your eminence, of a missionary who came to church one day and found all the women with their clothes tied around their waist. And he covered his eyes, a white missionary, because the top was open. And the women said, What is his problem? The country said, Your chest should be covered. Ah, we are. Uh, sorry. The following week or the following month, the missionary came back. These women removed the cloth from down and covered top. And the missionary said, This is worse. And the woman said, Which one does he want? We cover down, we look good. We cover up, we know what. Which one he want? When you want to dress properly for your parties, for interviews, you wear Versace, you wear Dolce and Gabbana, you wear Giorgio Armani. You wear Lacombe, you wear all those expensive designers that when you want to show your culture as a Nigerian, you go back to one piece of cloth. Something is wrong with us. By the way, if you attend any meeting anywhere in the world, a gathering, my young lady, you are welcome, a gathering of women from all over the world, Pull any of them by the hair, it will be natural, except Africans. African women have decided never to wear their natural hair. Beginning from some of these things that look like a mom, <laughs> till the Indian and Brazilian hairs that you spend money to buy. What is wrong with us? I say we are culture lazy. Why can't young Nigerian girls? design and develop systems of maintaining their hair that will make it admired throughout the world. This is where to begin. That is about education. Value-based. Skills position-based. And please know that before formal education was introduced, education was transmission of knowledge from elders to the younger ones. But that was because older people had acquired experience and there was no other way of acquiring such experience apart from age. Now our people have admitted no need to go The person who travels has more to tell than the person who is old. So, New experiences and new exposure are empowering you to be sources and agents of education. I'm also happy because from that education, value-based education, you can talk of ethical leadership. Ethical leadership, leadership based on values and morals. Without that type of leadership, no matter how much you change governments, nothing will change. I'm happy also about the issue of equality. But I have a warning, and especially also to Noel, who is living outside our context. When you talk about equality between men, That equality between male and female should not, should not automatically translate to the present gender ideology that is a political program. Because prove me wrong if I am. I have not discovered any African language that has the word for gender. But we have words for male and for female. So we have to be talking about equality between male and female, equality in dignity, equality in responsibility, and equal opportunities for all.
Be careful when they are being deceived. Those who are giving you lessons about the equality of women are those who discriminate in most. It is not long ago since women were allowed to vote in many of these so-called developed countries. And up to now, in some countries I know, a male, European countries I mean, a male and a female will be doing the same job and the man will be receiving better salary than the female, just because she is a woman. These are things you should contest. And looking at models of womanhood, glorious womanhood that we have all around the country to have many people to imitate. I would at this point just wish you fruitful exchange and I can't tell you how happy I am to have been a part of this engagement. I thank everybody who made it possible and I encourage all young people to know that you are not just leaders of tomorrow, you are leaders of today. I will end on this note. I was in Italy recently. And suddenly I started hearing some music. Collect your money. Wake up, wake up. I, I, I said, where am I? I looked around. Before I knew what I was, what I, where I was, the salesman in one of the shops was already, already doing ululululu, bogao. I, I said, is it how far it has gone? But immediately following that you have what is that with you? I want to flex my love I want to impress I want to carry my love away to the place the love I want to carry my love The same 28 year old Nigeria ruling the musical world twice in few months. If this Daniel could do it, why can't you? Thank you. The bishop is younger than myself, honestly speaking. Please put your hands together for the, my father bishop. Well, it is not unexpected of him, but today's classical presentation gets deep, deep into our problems and gives solution to it. Am I right? If I'm right, then give him another rousing real quick. Thank you. Hello, bishop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The youth are not leaders of tomorrow. They are leaders of uh, today. And we must take that home enough to tell them that uh, we must make a choice. These are words I drew from him. And we must make that choice. Please, a round of applause once again for him. Thank you, my Lord Bishop. We are grateful to you. As he said, we will be moving our way, but not in annoyance but because he had other programs. After a little discussion with his friend and his uh, cardinal, he may tell us when he would like to leave so that we can accord him that uh, respect and honor after taking his time from us. Thank you, my Lord Bishop. I will announce that uh, one of our guests is here, or two of them, very important ones at that, Three of them, thank you. 
I want to say that a man of ethical disposition. Uh, I wouldn't like to first introduce him as a, a political party candidate because he's worth more than that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce the two-time federal minister in Nigeria, a former director general of Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I'm referring to Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Frank, you're welcome. How is the campaign going? <laughs> Thank you very much. Frank Wake Jr. is a wonderful character. And I think he has all the potentials to lead any state in Nigeria. And I commend him for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The other panelists are here. And um, I would like in time to introduce them. But let me introduce one of the elderly persons who inspires me and inspired me and is still inspiring me. I'm talking about Dr. Godwin Ejike Abon, former local government chairman, former chairman of the Dodo local government. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. He's a man of a strong character. If I'm doing anything evil and he's around, I'll pretend to be good. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it is time for us to move further forward. We are going to, I have been told that Dr. Manning, Maureen Manning is not uh, immediately available, but we are going to the first session, plenary session, and that will be global education and the Nigerian struggle. We are going to keep to this for the five minutes, but if you permit me, I will want to first of all welcome the moderator. He's uh, an on-air personality we know all around here. Someone who is also very well known for his character and ability to deliver on radio. He's also uh, a crusader on radio against violence, and I know him for that. We just know him as Uche Uma. Please give him a round of applause as he comes up as the moderator of this plenary session.
reform our educational system, we have to um, employ the resources that we have, the skill sets that we have, and make sure that we have right people in the right place. That's another thing you can have. I'm not talking about the current administration. I have nothing to, I'm not a, a, politician, a politician. But in education, sometimes you also have people leading the segment that they don't have any, any business being in. They don't even know anything about When you say we, uh, who exactly do you mean? And uh, how much can we do without the government? Well, the government is, we are part of the government. We get to choose who governs us. If you know that the government that you have right now is not there for your own best interest of your children and the family and the society, we can change that. That's the power of being in a democratic uh, country. So we, we are all we. Yeah, we need to do more about that. I think we need to demand for, uh, for the best educational facilities for our children. Go to our universities. It doesn't even look like a place that we educate people. Go to the schools. When I come home, I visit the schools in the villages and all that. I've gone to schools in it. I'm from Enugu in Stogrute. So I've gone to schools there. And it's so embarrassing even to see where children are sitting in ordinary, uh, what do you call it, um, piece of wood or plank that is sitting on the floor. And they're supposed, supposed to be learning. So we are, all of us are the we, if I'm making any sense. All right, put your hands together for... Now, let, let, let me bring on Mr. Frank Mweke, uh, Jr. Uh, what will your opening statement sound like in relation okay. to the topic? Um, first of all, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me start by uh, paying my respects to Mr. Lumona for putting this together and for just your interest in uh, championing the cause of uh, boys. It's a great initiative. Now, it's always difficult to speak after professors, not being one myself. <laughs> but I'm going to just, um, um, I'm going to just piggyback on one particular statement she made. Everything she's described, I agree with. The state of our education sector, the state of our polity, I completely agree. But there's a statement she made. She says, I am not a politician. And this is a common statement that you find within our society. And I want to tell this audience today that there is nothing more important than politics. Absolutely nothing. Including the church. Politics affects everything. Business. Politics affects everything. Now, everything she's described are symptoms of poor leadership. And how does public leadership emerge in any society? It is through politics, the political parties. People get elected, they get into office. And so the quality of your education sector depends on the quality of your political leadership. Whether your roads are smooth or not depends on the quality of your political leadership. Whether your health centers work or not 
depends on the quality of your political leadership whether you are safe on the roads in your homes in your offices depends on the quality of political leadership that is really what it is everything you've described is symptomatic let us take the state in which we are today Enugu state in the last several months in fact over the past seven years we've had incessant strikes by primary school teachers and what has been at stake what has been at stake is a demand by these group of teachers to be paid what you call the minimum wage that minimum wage is 30,000 naira and it was agreed across the Federation about five years ago and some states had been implementing this in the state had been implementing but not for all categories of workers and of all the people that the government chose not to implement the minimum wage for it was primary school teachers and so the question is this what does the, your failure or refusal to implement a policy of minimum wage for primary school teachers what does that say about the mindset of that political leader or this political leadership it just shows clearly that you do not understand that education is critical to development that is what it says and if i had to choose for instance amongst the three levels of education if you absolutely force me or compel me to choose one what do you think that choice would be ladies and gentlemen primary, primary school is what i will choose that early childhood education is what i would choose because that is the foundation for any kind of human capital development in any sensible part of the world in any any sensible state so it's important dear ma'am please do not say that you're not a politician we all participate in the political process in one way or the other we all participate in some form of politics whether it's in your school whether it's amongst your uh, 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 church society whether it's amongst your social club or one thing or the other leaderships will emerge through processes that are agreed by a group of people now a very important point that madam made is this very very important point she made about the issue of ch early childhood education and i'm happy that you recognize the role of parents in early childhood education before that child enters a classroom that child has started learning in his or her mother's womb but like you identified if this woman and this man who are parents do not even have the consciousness about their responsibility to their child how what kind of outcome would you expect what kind of life you think that child would have there's no way that child will have a good life and so for me as governor by god's grace my greatest partners my most important partners will be mothers my most important partners will be fathers as well but mothers more critically because mothers are the ones through gestation who already form the first relationship with that child mothers through childbirth are the ones who then begin to nurture the first relationship the child will call mama first it is the mother that strives at all times to ensure that those children eat. In the last several days, I've spent time in the hinterland, different parts of Enugu, and I met a child called Madabuchi, a little child. Madabuchi lives in an area of town, a massive slum, where Madabuchi at three, his sister at five, another one at seven, they have to cohabit with drug addicts. With some of the most violent human beings that god created i went to uh, 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 uh kan west now somewhere in Apu, with different communities i met dabari chuku an orphan dabari chuku is starving i met chinonso a young girl she's starving what kind of learning can that child have the schools are not even there so for me when you're talking about early childhood the government has an important role to play hungry children cannot learn and so for me a school meal program is critical to learning for children and it is going to be a cardinal program for my administration by God's special grace anyway. just no way uh, just, just before I, I move over to 
And the next Have you, person. Are you done with me? But yeah, I'm not almost, done with you now. Almost, almost, almost. The other thing that Madam said, which I want to reinforce, is this. Again, teachers and teaching. Teachers and teaching. You know, I received a group of pensioners about, say, two months ago. And they came, said, please, sir, we want to talk to you. We'd like to know what you want to do about our pensions when you become governor. And these were elderly people. Elderly people. And I don't want to begin to describe the condition in which I saw these people. But there was a particular man that caught my attention amongst all the people. He was the eldest amongst them. And he was barely managing to walk. And what I'm about to share with you, I have on record. He said, I have told my children that under no circumstance should any of them become a teacher. And he spoke like that because he said, and he went on to say one of his greatest regrets was actually becoming a teacher. He said the humiliation he had suffered, the indignity he has had, he suffered. The question is this, if you do not pay the teachers well, if you do not honor them, if you do not show clearly that these are important members of society, you are endangering that profession, you are endangering the children, you are endangering our future. And last but not the least is this, teacher training as well. There's a lot of people because of the high unemployment who have taken to teaching not because they love to teach. Teaching is not something that you go into, at least you shouldn't go into it unless you have a passion for it. I love to teach and that's why from time to time I'm guest lecturer at the Nigerian Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. I'm a senior visiting fellow at the Lagos Business School. I'm also a senior visiting fellow at the School of Politics, Policies and Governance because I love to teach. It's right. just a passion. But the teachers that are going to teach our children, let it not be that they strayed into this area. Let it be people who have the passion and you must find them. And when you have found them, you must give them the right training not just once but on an ongoing basis because no one can give what they do not have so if we want to have children who are going to be smart and competitive and can compete globally then we must have teachers who are smart who are also who can also compete uh, compete globally so this will be my initial comments thank you very well, much your hands together, all right um i'll move over to you um Mr. Chikezerun Chima, okay. So then tell you, you are the University of Nigeria, so you've tested both sides, and so uh, you can talk about it confidently. So let's start with your opening statement, and then do a bit of uh, comparative analysis of uh, education right here and education abroad. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I must start by saying that there's very, very little to say left <laughs> after the two first <laughs> excellent speakers. You still found um, something to say. But I would say that, um, or I would start with asking a question, is education still the key? Many young people would disagree based on their experiences, and uh, many young people in Nigeria especially. Um, and when we are growing up, of course, our parents and the older generation taught us or socialized us to believe that education was the key to success. And of course, it was at their time when someone would finish school and um, a job was almost sure, right? Um, but today, if education means, you know, the basic education up to the university level, and um, we believe is the key, I don't think it corresponds with the reality of today. And um, what I would say is that one of the reasons is that um, young people's perspectives are not really um, incorporated into um, education design and development. Um, the our site is changing in enormous ways. Um, you know, the aspirations of young people are changing too with it. And um, I'm sure that what you, as a younger person, um, wanted for your life might be a bit different from what people today want or what they dream about or their general aspirations. Um, so I would like to, uh, you know, see an education, you know, system that evolves um, to meet up with what young people of today want and their aspirations and their dreams and also to meet up with the changes um, we're we are witnessing today in society. As for the cooperative analysis you asked for, 
um, yes, I've studied in four or five countries, universities, um, across, you know, continents. And I think I could, um, you know, say a few things. Um, one of them is that um, education, for instance, in the UK, where I did my last um, stint, um, is so much focused on the students. Um, the way they learn, like it's somehow personalized, you know. Um, the teacher or the lecturer tries to personalize um, a teaching experience to suit the students. Um, while here, because of, of course, low funds, um, because of the enormous large or enormously large um, number of people we have per class, um, it's a bit dif um, difficult um, for the teacher to streamline um, the curriculum or, you know, the teaching practice or the teaching itself to suit the students. And it's something um, I would like to see more um, happening in Nigeria here. Um, so that's basically what um, I would like to say as my opening statement, and I hope to you know, engage more. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, let me ask a question uh, on the, you mentioned education, design, and development. Uh, what I think that means is that before you even start trying to educate people, you must have a, a blueprint of the kind of people it should develop. Uh, the bishop talked about, you know, uh, the kind of people we developed during their time uh, based on what the colonial masters needed. Okay, I would like you to talk more about education design and development. Okay, um, I, would like, uh, uh, I would like to start with the story. So, um, in my degree in Germany, we had people from around 30 countries in my cohort. And um, it wasn't, of course, planned, but when it happened, it was new, it was novel for the university. And so they sat us down and they, you know, they asked us individually what we expected to get from this program. And then they made it international. They made it um, you know, suit us as internationals or as, you know, as foreigners or you know, as people from different countries. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I would like to see, where the students are consulted more and visibly too um, in curriculum design and where the, um, you know, the design of education or educational curriculum is based on evidence, um, based on current research. Um, of course, people are doing great work and great research in education, um, people like Professor Nkechi here, and um, I've never seen, or I don't know, but I don't think you've ever been consulted um, you know, um, to help the government or, or you know, the school system or the education board um, design um, learning methods or something. Uh, so they need to engage more globally. Um, our people are studying, and some of their, you know, their data is gotten from Nigeria here as well. And so they could actually use the research that we are doing, we as researchers are doing, um, to develop the curriculum or the education system more. Yeah. All right. Let, let, let me quickly, because of our time, and by the way, uh, we'll be taking questions uh, any moment from now. And then when you ask your question, you can also direct it to a particular member of a panel. Uh, doc, uh, Professor Nkichi, um, you teach teachers. Uh, incidentally, uh, the, the, the problem we have is that the, the biggest players, or who should be the biggest players, and that's government, is also the biggest problem. So uh, how do we circumvent? Is there any way to circumvent government or to get them to do what needs to be done to, to catalyze education really in Nigeria? Sure, you know, I wanted to maybe um, touch a little bit with what my brother was talking about. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, I, I still stand my ground. I'm not a politician. <laughs> Poli politics to me is, uh, going into politics is like somebody going into medicine or going into law or going into education. We all choose our path to make, uh, our path to make impact. Just because I'm not a politician by, profess by profession doesn't mean that I'm not making an impact. So my impact is more how do I rally parents. I do a lot of parent education. I like to empower parents because they are left in the decision making of their children. And our parents don't even know that they are the change agent. If we mobilize ourselves, yesterday during the professional development, I'm, I was saying, if we mobilize ourselves, parents, grandparents, and demand the change, it will happen. If you're not doing what you're supposed to do in your post as a politician, we will vote you out. 
We put you in there, we can take you out, right? So that's what I meant in terms of that. So I want to stand my ground on that because as an educationist, God is using me as that vessel to do my own work. And he's a politician by profession, or he chose to go into, you know, he's also an educationist, but he chose to add that layer. So we are all being called to do our work. And I think once you honor your purpose on this earth, then God will use you as his instrument to do the work. So in terms of getting the government involved and all that, again, it depends on the people. What do we want? I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And when you go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, different, different communities are getting different types of education because of the involvement in there. They are demanding more, they know what they want to do and all those kind of things. And funding for education in the U.S. is a little different too. It's also based on property taxes and all that. And the fight we are fighting in Grand Rapids, Michigan or, or throughout the U.S. is that the funding also needs to be equitable to make sure that that community that don't have a whole lot coming from their property tax that the government can supplement that. In Nigeria, it's a little different, right? So we are expecting the government to do a whole lot, but we have to hold our government accountable. We have to hold them accountable by starting uh, looking at the people that we are electing to go, having some kind of conversation. The other work that I do in U.S. is I help raise funds and establish schools in vulnerable communities so that these children can have a quality beginning. Early learning opportunities is critical needed in any, any community that you go. And that's the way to set it. You can tell of a, of a society by how they treat their young children. And Nigeria will get an F. I don't even know how we're going to look our maker in the eye by the way we treat our children. Our, our politicians, our leaders and all that flying their children over overseas to get education and they know that the education they're leaving behind is not even good for their own kids. So why don't we start with that? So getting the government again, we have to make sure that we're electing the ones that is, uh, is going to do the work. Parents need to rise. Mothers need to rise. We need to advocate. This is not the time where we have to stay behind and just watch for other people to dictate what is going to happen to our own children, to our community. So we need to write. So getting everybody together. Um, my brother Chike was talking about the whole code design. It's very, very important. I don't even know how we design elementary school without involving the parents. You have to involve the parents. What are the values that we want our children to get at? How can parents be in a part of the educational system? So it's, it's so many things that we need to do, and I don't know if we can do justice yeah. with it and all that. But educational reform takes so many steps. And the one prescription, if I'm allowed to say that in Nigeria, is that we have to totally reform our educational system from early childhood education looking at the pipeline to the hands of. And when I talk about early childhood education, I'm talking about children from birth to eight years of age. That's the standard of early childhood education. So if the kids are not ready by age five, we have to do something to make sure they're ready to get into K-12 education, okay? Or in this case, elementary school and then uh, GS primary and then the SGS and then SS and all the, all the different layers, the different hands of need to be strengthened. Again, the, the pedagogy, how we teach our teachers. Who is teaching our teachers? How are we holding them responsible and accountable to everything? How are we connecting the dot, making sure that when a child leaves any part of the school that they are whole? I'm talking about holistic approach to education. I don't, I don't really want to uh, associate with people who cognitively are very high, but emotionally they're not. They blow up on you, they get agitated, they get upset. You can't have a, an argument with them because we're not paying attention to the whole child to make sure that this is a child. So you want to design education, let's take a typical uh, child. What do we want this child to be when they finish elementary school, when they finish secondary school, when they finish, uh, finish uh, university and all that? And there are different types of education. Too. Not all children are supposed to go to the university. All right. They're, 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 seriously, there are something called, called vocational education, technical education. 
we need people to repair cars we need people to do this we need to do so everybody's part is not a university there are some people that will go to technical school and you know we have all kinds of schools so when we talk about school we're really using the global word to describe education so what are you destined for how can we make sure that children know what they are our our my friend here talking about going for what you are very passionate about all right you know Put your hands together for prof okay um just before i start taking your questions i would like um mr frank Winker jr there's a story you will normally tell to young people What's I, I, I don't know uh, if you can say it as fast as you can how you know, you went back to the school where ah. you went to. Oh. So if you don't mind, oh, just you, do that. Okay, and then you heard we me can say that before. Yes. Okay, well, <laughs> okay. well excellent uh, remarks, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, this, I think what Uche is referring to is um, something I shared some time ago. Um, so I went to a high school called um, Federal Government College in Meduguri. And I was there... Um, I left that school in 1982 and um, I didn't return to that school until about 22 years after um, it was a very good school a public school a public school and this it was one of the schools called uh, the unity it's one of the school a set of schools called the unity colleges that were established post Nigerian Civil War to really bring children from diverse backgrounds diverse uh, tribes and uh, religion uh, religious uh, disposition to really you know raise them together and is a way of promoting national unity and uh, cohesion so i went to Paragomen college my degree and so i returned there in uh, 2004 22 years after i first left and um, on that occasion the principal had invited me because they had serious problem with erosion uh, the hostels were being uh, were falling into uh, gullies and other things and I went there and I almost had a heart attack I could not believe it was the same school that I left just 22 years earlier the hostels were in the worst possible conditions that you could think about the children the children have started raping the boys have started raping the, the boys have started forming cult gangs. They have started selling their beds. Door frames, window frames were being sold in the same school by children of similar age as when I was there. And this really, really broke me. Just really, really devastated me. Okay. And that is the story that he's talking about. And so it still speaks to the issue of uh, the attention we pay to our values and the role that parents have to play. It's not just the schools that form or shape the values and ethical disposition of children. The parents are even, they have higher responsibility to my mind what, to really the help to shape. What's between when you went to school there and what it is right now? What changed? Well, what changed is just a set of values. And then the role of parents and i want to say maybe just share a little bit about myself so i eventually ended up as a federal minister in the federal cabinet the highest decision making body in the country but even in that role i had a father who would still write me letters who would still remind me of who i am the training he gave me and what he expects of me he will constantly constantly remind me I don't want to hear your name associated with any kind of malfeasance. I don't want to hear your name associated with any kind of graft. I cannot because I will call a press conference and disown you. And my father, who passed in 2012, I know him. If any such thing had, had, had happened, my father would have called a press conference to say, I do not know this fellow. So for me, parents must be parents. Parents must do what parents are supposed to do which is to nurture, which is to teach, which is to encourage, to monitor. And so at my age at that time, my father was still writing me letters, reminding me constantly. So our society has not always been the way it is today. 
it's not always been focused on just money it's not always been focused on just what you are what car you ride what clothes you wear it's not always been focused on these things so there's been a progressive degeneration of our value system and i believe that the, the uh, you know i believe in that we must return to what i call first principles this first principles is that family nurture the values that you impart to these children when they are with you before they even begin to go out and the accountability to which you hold them even when i remember even growing up in primary school when i have come back with the wrong shoes my father my mother will follow me to school the next morning to say no 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 please this is not his own shoe who took his own shoe take your shoe back and give us our own shoe she was the one that no 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 this ruler you you went with is this is not your own your your name is on your own please all those things she, they were that attentive to what was going on today the difference is that you have fathers or mothers who will say to you how did your mate make it these are the kinds of things you hear parents saying to you right, so we must go back to first principles those are my thoughts thank you um, we need to start uh, taking questions uh, but I already have one here. Uh, maybe you take the mic to the people. Uh, the first question goes to Professor Nkechi and it says, what is your take on special education of children with learning and physical disabilities? What is my take on it? Well, first of all, I don't call them special education ch children. I call them children with special rights. Um, the reason why I call them uh, children with special rights is that they, those children, some of the children that we call special education have certain rights that you and I don't even have, right? They have certain um, abilities that we don't have. But yes, we must recognize that uh, within education we have a continuum. We have children on this side who needs extra help. So you may call them they have low cognitive ability or physical and otherwise healthy children you also have the majority of us so-called normal children who are in the middle and then you have children on this end of the continuum who are gifted and talented in certain area know that also that knowledge is domain specific there are children that are very smart but they are also the kind that we think okay they lack a little bit on the common sense but they are very smart. They can do any equation they give them. So first of all, we have to assess children. So within any educational system, whether it's early childhood education, uh, K-12 or tertiary, whatever you want to call it, we have to assess children to see where they are. Even before you get into a university, we have the, the SAT or we have WIEC or whatever you have to get to know where the children can be placed. So my take is that we have to recognize them, first of all, that they are human beings. They are created just the way we are all created. So we have to respect them. We have to honor them. We have to assess them and see where they are coming from. What do they need to reach their potential? My potential is different from Chike's potential. Chike's potential is different from um, my, Frank's, uh, uh, Mr. Frank's potential. But once we assess children, all children, then we should be able to know what do they need and design the curriculum that will fit them so that they can reach their potential. When I was, before I came here doing my research, 95.5% of so-called special education or special needs children in Nigeria are out of school. They are home. You know why most of our children are home? Because Nigeria still have this image. If a child is not up to the ability of other children, we put them behind because we don't want to a our dirty laundry. We don't want anybody to know that we have a child who have a special need. You walk around and you see children that have Down syndrome. There are children who have what I call established condition. When you see them, you know. Due to genetic malfunction or whatever, when you see a Down syndrome child, you know a Down syndrome child. We see a child who's blind, you know a child who's blind. I'm also equally worried about those children who have environmental risk or environmental issue. Children have been sitting in old houses that are full of lead. Lead have poisoned their brain and so many things. Children that are not getting good water, clean water. 
You see where our children are roaming around, they're getting all those environmental issues and it's messing them up. So we have to assess our children, know where they are, co-design. teach them. There are nine multiple intelligences, the way of knowing things. So we also have to make sure that we tell all that uh, curriculum to the, those children that they needed. But, but, you know, ultimately I would say that all our children need attention. All right. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, we need to get that quickly. My time is almost up. Uh, just indicate by raising your hands. Okay. Just move us uh, how many are we taking? So we might just take a question from one, two, three rows and then we're done. Okay. And I prefer two females and a guy. So is there a female on this line? Any female on this line? So I'll take from a guy and then we move to the other side. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my question uh, goes to us. Uh, just yesterday, the National Summit on Education, Tertiary Education Reform just ended. and. One of the main points that was discussed then was the student loan bank. So I would want to, particularly to Dr. Frank Wenke Jr., I want to know your disposition about the student loan bank, bearing in mind that it has been done before and it failed. So what assurances does the government or do you think that will help us to maximize that particular bill? Thank you very much. All right, let's get all the questions and then they can respond. Uh, as fast as they can. Uh, Vaughn, thank you. Any female on this line? Okay. Where are the females? Okay, good morning. Oh, I am Saniki Juliet. Okay, my question goes to Professor Nkechi. Um, how can I, as a parent, discover my child's cause given talent like how do i align him or her to that very thing she's ought to do or to be in life thank you beautiful question okay let's take one more and uh, we'll move on okay uh, move over there sorry we can take as many questions as we're supposed to My name is Franklin. My question goes like this. They say education is a critical thing in every is society. Is there a particular person you're asking? Yes. Okay. Or let me say to every, all of them there. Okay. We'll give it to, <laughs> we'll give it to you. So, uh, okay. yeah, so, so get ready to answer they that. They say education is a critical thing every society needs. Then, using Nigeria as an example, every two, two months, Nigeria produces over two million graduates pass that pass out then where will all these people work where there is no employment then what is the the success now the sense of the education thank you all right mr frank you might want to start okay well first of all thank you excellent question on the um student loan uh, bank um i'm glad that you you also noted that uh, that initiative is not exactly novel i mean it's not new it's been done in the past the question is why did it fail it's still going to take us back to the issue of leadership. I'm very big on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And so if you look at our country today, whether you're talking about it from an economic development or disaster point of view, whether you, when you look at insecurity in our country, anything you want to look at today in this country or in this state particularly, whether it's working or failing is because of ineptitude, incompetent leadership. So that's critical. So as a matter of fact, the student loan bank that collapsed way back was also on account of ineptitude, incompetent leadership, and corruption. So it is critical this time around that in, uh, uh, in, um, in um, getting the, back, uh, the, uh, the bank uh, back on stream that we gain a full understanding of what happened and make sure we have the right checks and balances to make sure that it does not fail again. But let me also add on a personal basis. Anything, any initiative that will help to promote education, that will help students or uh, interested parties to really fulfill their dreams. But even more importantly, as someone interested in public administration, as someone who understands the critical role of education, 
as a government we would work very very assiduously to make sure that vulnerable students disadvantaged students who do not have the resources or have the capacity to advance the education that they have access to the resources that they require because the government of the day will make it possible that's number one then the gentleman who asked about um who asked about um, um uh, employment opportunities right again another excellent question and let me say this very very clearly it still comes to the issue of okay thank you I'm going to still bring it back to the issue of uh, leadership and it's important for me to situate it say in our own state context or our local context here in Enugu and you find that government has only ability to recruit only so many people as a matter of fact yes government has a role to play in employment generation but not in the way that people look at it not as a major employers of labor the role of government any sensible government is to create an environment which will attract manufacturers industries businesses to their to their state it is these businesses that will help to really absorb the large number of young people that are coming out of schools or who are coming out from vocational centers and skill centers and let me explain this to you that had always been the case until recently and I'm going to go back very quickly, if I have your permission. No, right? just, just I'll, go, I'll go back very quickly. And so you look at between 1958 and 1966, eight years, the government of the former Eastern region, that was when they created, that was when they established the Calabo Cement Company. That was when Calabar Cement Company was established. That was when the Michelin tire industry in Port Harcourt was built. That was when the glass factory in Abba was built. That was when Hotel Presidential Enugu was built. That was when Hotel Presidential Port Harcourt was built. That was when the University of Nigeria and Suka was created. That was when Adan Rice was, was created. That was when Rison Palm in River State was built. That was when United Palms in Oji was created. That was when Niger Gas was built. That was when Niger Steel was built. That was when I can go on and on and on because they understood the critical importance of job creation. They were clear that they needed to actually provide employment opportunities whilst industrializing the, 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 the region for young people. After that, you look at the former governor, Jim Ifanjibu Mwobodo. Within a space of four years as well, Nikki Lake was built. The Anambra Vegetable Oil Company was built. That was when you had the Greater Enugu Water uh, uh, Works built. As you had the Greater Abakiliki Water Works. That was when you had Asu Tech, as it then was built. The current Asu uh, uh, um, was built. That was when you had Premier Breweries uh, established in Onisha at the time. So many industries. That was when uh, uh, Transekulu was established. All of these uh, 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 initiatives would catalyze jobs, would create jobs. All right. So it is not so much government employing people, it is government putting in place the right policies, the right regulation, the right incentives for people to find their states attractive. Thank you. That is really what it should be. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's get your uh, reaction to the question. I'm, I'm, I'm marveled and fascinated by, by all you have in your head, Mr. Farquhar. <laughs> you could go on and on and on. Thank you. And thank you so much for giving us that compelling response. Um, my research is focused on youth, youth empowerment. And um, I always start, you know, I always approach, you know, the research with the question, what does youth empowerment mean to you? Or what comes to your mind when you hear youth empowerment for the first time? And most people you know, perhaps jocularly say um, giving Tekena Pep or giving um, bikes to people. Um, but to be more serious, um, I think of empowerment, you know, on three levels. It's empowerment on three levels. And the first and most critical is education, um, which keys into what we are talking about today. But education is also not enough. Um, and that's why I also want to touch on what you said, Mr. Frank political empowerment. Um, if young people are provided the right education that they need, or if the, let's assume 
that the environment you know is is, is convenient for you know proper um, you know productive education or constructive education um, is our political um, you know environment also suitable for young people to thrive um, and that's where I agree with you um, mr. Frank um, that empowerment is also very very key on the political level and I'm very very impressed with young people like me in Nigeria who are beginning to wake up politically and be more engaged and involved and interested um, in politics. I could see it on Twitter every day that I log in, and uh, you know, I, could say, I could go on and on. And the third level um, for me on which empowerment occurs is economic empowerment. But you cannot, of course, um, talk about economic empowerment without first of all arresting the first two points or the first two levels I talked about, education and politics. Um, so yes, just to attend to your question further, um, without proper, um, it, without approaching um, empowerment properly, if we just focus on education, without focusing on politics, without focusing on how to perhaps change the orientation of young people, um, you know, to key into opportunities, um, we do not, we should not wait for the government, of course, to provide you know, all the jobs, and of course, they even, they even cannot do it. Um, but we can, of course, look at um, you know, the trends and create opportunities for ourselves or key into opportunities. But to go back, all this cannot work without the first two levels I mentioned. So that's the contribution I want to make here. Thank all right. you. Um, quickly, let's get uh, Professor Nkichi, and that will be the end. No, that, we're coming to an end. Uh, we're coming to an end. Oh, sorry. Um, I love my question. My question is about how do you, as a parent, yeah. help your child to reach their God-given potential? Well, number one, I say I'm a mother of five, so I'm speaking from experience. You have to let your children know who they are. You have to let them know who they are, know where they're going, know who they are hanging out with, Engage them in everything that you're doing at home. Use ordinary moments and daily routine to help raise your children. You don't have to have a PhD in child development. You don't have to have a BA in education to know that your children need to be involved. Use whatever you're doing, your cooking, your cleaning, um, to help them, right? So I know being in U.S., I didn't have a nanny, I didn't have my mom, nobody to help me. Every Friday, we clean house. I put my music, whether they like it or not, we're going to dance to my music. We're going to clean, we're going to cook. You do time management. We set up what we need for the whole week. I don't like my children to cry in the morning because they didn't find the second shoe or the, the socks didn't match. We line everything up so that, and because when they cry, my, the whole day just mess up for them. If you look at them, they're going to get upset with you because you look at them. And I say, mother, my heart is not in one place because I'm going to work thinking about what, what we could have done. Honestly, we set up our clothes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which, your, which shoe? We put it on there with the socks and all those kind of things. Once you have an organized, disciplined house, things will work out a little better. I spoke life into my children. I remember one day my daughter, she's a lawyer now, she was four years old. She said, Mommy, I'm going to be a lawyer when I grow up. I said, You are? I said, Starting from today, you have to act like a lawyer. So show me how lawyers walk. Show me how lawyers talk. And then the other one came in and said, I want to be a medical doctor. I said, Okay. We went to a garage sale. In America, we have garage sale, like a thrift like you you call okay like you buy used things we bought it i booked my husband and i we bought an old stethoscope and she wore that a house, around in the house measuring everybody speaking life to your child show me how it, how the lawyers work how do they carry themselves and all that? They have it in their mind and build it in there. And then the other one say, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. I say, what do you want to be? I want to be an artist. Okay, you're going to be an artist. You draw. Anything you want us to buy for you, you have to draw it. We take it to the store. If it comes closer to what you drew, we'll buy it for you. So the point I'm making is that 
not, not everybody is going to use this schedule or the way to do that. But I know that I needed to be disciplined with my children. We have a curfew. I got called to the principal's office because my children told the principal that I don't let them say our pastime. Thank to the principal because I'm from a different culture, so I don't understand. So I went to the principal's office and I said, well, you know, I'm going to parent them the way my parents parented me. And Americans, you guys are crazy. I don't want anybody to kill my children because if you got them outside, then somebody is going to say, what happened? Where is the parent? So have a disciplined life. Make sure you know where, where your children are. Who are they hang, hanging out? What you pour in is what you're going to get. Right. And don't let the teachers tell you otherwise. You go find out how your children are acting in a class. You work with the teacher, not to disrespect them or you know, embarrass them, but work with them to raise the child that you want to see. Now, I'm not saying that all my kids are perfect, but every day I say that they're perfect and they're awesome because the more you say that, the more they will appreciate the that because that's how you see them. Hard. Thank you, Chikesarim, uh, Chimamwake. Thank you, Professor Ankechi. And thank you, phenomenal Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. It's been nice doing this. And thank you, uh, Boys Champion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, would we give them a round of applause? especially to the moderator for doing a good job. Thank you very much. Uh, they are all professors, if I should say, and Kechi is topping the list as a professor today. Frank Wilke Jr. takes the title of Mr. And I think that's right enough, but today we are going to confer him on a professorial seat. Prof, thank you so much. You're a humble man and very brilliant too. A round of applause for them too. While they are stepping down, may I call on one or two persons to appreciate what they have done today. And I'm talking about General Sunday Eze. If you don't mind, sir, just one word or two because we are listening attentively before I ask, I ask uh, His Eminence to do us one favor as that. Wow. Uh, talk about uh, un unscripted uh, jobs. I was not uh, <coughs> I was not uh, one beforehand that I would uh, uh, do this job, but uh, it's an easy one uh, because all of us have seen what they did. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to ask, if I was given the opportunity, which I have now, is that we have to look at the the macroeconomic policy of government at the federal level, <clears throat> and then we have to look at globalization and the, the advantage of scale in setting up uh, industries and in factories. I'm talking about it because you see the effect of, uh, of uh, globalization on industries that are set up even in advanced uh, countries. You know, when Trump was there, uh, he was uh, uh, placing so, so much tariffs on the Chinese imports because he said that it was killing aspects of the American industry, right? So the first thing that we need to do, or one of the things that I think we need to pay attention to is the quality of our governance at federal level. I am talking, I'm saying this because of the persons who are asking about uh, where they are going to get employment. Thank so you. it is a holistic thing. I thank uh, the panelists for the fantastic job that they have done, uh, as I have not asked to do. Thank, thank you, you very much. Please, a round of applause for him. Thank you. We are going to move fast and forward, and I would like to invite Mr. Von Nwadukwe to make an announcement. If he is readily available, he can do that now. But if he is not round, we'll be... Okay, he's there. Von, please make the announcement. Thank you. Hello guys. Hi guys. Are we having fun? Are we enjoying this conference? Please put your hands together again for the convener and for yourselves. You are an amazing audience. You are an amazing audience. So, um, 
just in case you took pictures before you came in here, that's outside of the red carpet or at the um, green turf over there. We we'll would love it if you post it online. Uh, we will appreciate that. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Please use the hashtag shaping the future. Hashtag shaping the future or hashtag ASTCM, STF 2022. Hashtag STF 2022. We're also streaming this event live on all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, as well as on Facebook. So you can follow Boys Champion or you can also follow Shaping the Future and this has been um, streamed live. Share the live streams so that your friends and others who are not here can participate and also enjoy what you are Thank enjoying you. here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vaughan. Your Eminence, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have is a very fine young gentleman. I'll allow him to introduce himself. Good afternoon. Introduce yourself. Chike Mwoke. I'm a PhD student um, at Carlton University in Canada, and I'm also a research consultant for a couple of NGOs in Nigeria and, and um, in the diaspora as well. All right, that's very nice. Okay, we saw you giving a, a little bit of talk in there, so could you tell us how the event has been so far and impacted you? Um, yes, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the event was excellently organized, and we have key speakers um, who have come from different parts of the world um, to speak about issues that are very, um, you know, um, pertinent to young people. Thrive, and we only thrive to survive here on the streets. Education is key, but what good a key where there are no doors for the poor? We dream dreams because dreams are free, but reality has a fee. You need teachers, you need books, you need to cook ideas that are off the hook. You need an unbreakable mindset that screams, I can. You need a plan and discipline tough enough to withstand the wind that comes with the desire to win on the streets. You need uniforms, you need to fit in to be seen, you need thick skin tough enough to block even bullets or the poignant scorn on your neighbor's green each time you dare to try to fly without wings again and again till you break down with realization that no amount of motivation can ever equal education. For what good a fertile ground where there are no seeds to sow? And what good a seed if it never grows? That was to get your attention. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. Good afternoon. I am honored to be in your midst today. Thank you so much for this platform. Thank you, Boys Champion, for this. So the title of my spoken word proper is The Devil. And I wrote a lot of spoken word pieces that um, touches the sexual gender-based violence theme. But why I picked this one in particular is because this particular spoken word exposes the identity of the people or the perpetrators of sexual gender-based violence and also it goes like by extension right now, sir, it is very very lovely to have you in our midst today could you please tell us how you feel so far i feel great i mean um i uh, when i was first invited here i honestly didn't know what to expect i'd heard a lot about the uh, the promoter or the, the the anchor or the coordinator uh, Mr. Fani Alumona, and I'd read up about him. Very impressive uh, resume, uh, very impressive initiative. Uh, but, you know, when I was coming here, um, I, I didn't really know what to expect, you know, given my uh, previous experiences with people and events in Enugu. But I want to say that it's probably one of the A young person, excellent world class. So I feel good. Home into a forest. Home now the Sambisa of silent shame, wailing winds and thorns. And our lives is growing thorns are torn. I know the devil like I know the taste of my own tears and the contouring of mother's fears. The devil likes to drink, he likes to talk. The devil is charming, evident from the manner of his walk. He likes to see mother talk and he hates it when she talks. The devil. The devil spends most of his night out and on night is not out. He spends sipping coffee and staring at the TV screen. He likes the house clean and he seems to like the sound of mother's screams and his favorite color is green. But he likes his suit black and he likes his coffee black and he seems to like the sound of his belt on mother's back. He said he loves mother and she says it back. But he takes it back when he smacks and hits the mistress from the back. I am the devil's mistress. He calls me his little princess. He likes the sound of his knuckle dig deep into mother's flesh. He likes the tangle of his flesh on my flesh. The devil wears a bowler hat. A man of class, the devil is the working class. He provides. When I hear his whip, he uses his fist, he improvised. 
The devil is a man of principle. He never spares the word, a man of his word. The devil is a Christian. He goes to church. And under his right arm, he carries his Bible tight. And he always pays his tight. The devil is respected. The devil wears the marks of my hero. The devil was my hero. The devil is my stepfather. Which is why I've come to tell on the devil today. That the devil is the biggest coward I know. That hides his wedding ring. Still lies and hides to defile me. And when I threaten to tell, he threatens to kill me. See, the devil eats my mother's flesh for dinner. Drinks her blood after dinner. I watch her fade away by the day. She grows thin and thinner. So I told on the devil. The devil is mad. The devil is furious. Business the devil in the is world. And what do I mean by this? It is through politics that public leadership emerges. And it is the quality of political leadership that emerges from your politics that determines whether you're in school or not, that determines whether you have hostels or not, that determines whether your teachers are on strike or not, that determines whether you're kidnapped or not kidnapped, that determines the cost of food in the market, that determines whether you achieve your purpose in life or not. So in this political season, I want our young people to please rise up to the occasion. Make sure that you have a card, a permanent voter's card, PVC. Make sure that you vote. Women and respect them. So I wanted to just do these two pieces and go, but let's shake this hall a little bit. Shaping the future. I want to leave something before I leave. So this is my final piece. <laughs> this society gives my body a cause for debate. Makes my body a walking reminder of my place in this society. See, this society has turned my body into a house of limitations. Into a house where all my dreams and aspirations are reduced to age, to class, black, woman, religion, cripple, sickle, too fat, too thin, too poor, too dream, too irrelevant to be seen. And not even enough thick skin could prepare me for this. See, this is how society reduces me, reduces you, breaks you into bits of indecision. But right here on this crossroad of decision, follow your intuition. Do not despair, do not fear to do what is right, do not lose sight of the bigger picture. But these dreams you know, you are not of today, but that of the future. So teach your legs to walk out from conversation that threatens your conviction. Teach your hands to pull out from societal limitation that dares of futuristic inclination. Teach your mouth to speak up, speak out, rebuke doubt, rebuke reasons why your dreams could go south. Teach your eyes to stay fixated on the goal. Teach your mind to focus as you go. Say dreams needs no permission from neither race, religion, height, nor size. So when next society gives your body a cause for the baby, teach your body to give it back. Thank you. This is an incredible child of today. Please a round of applause for her. Have sat. The society has taught you that your thin body must uh, fix fixatedly on the ball. Give her another gracious round of applause, for she is wonderful. I would confess I've never met any young lady as bright as this. Congratulations. We are proud of you. And for somehow, I think I'm related to you one way or the other. <laughs> you understand what I mean? <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are enjoying ourselves. If you are not, I am. I want to welcome my friend who I've never met. He's a man I knew earlier as a PDP man. We are not talking politics here. But then, this is a man who sends shockwaves all across everyone some days ago in August and said, I am quitting that party and joining the Labour Party because Peter O.B. is my mentor and somebody I appreciate for Nigeria. Please welcome Valentine Ozibo, a former candidate for PDP, and he is here today. And I have been told that he's representing his uh, principal and that he's telling us that his principal will be here any moment from now, and that's why he has come as he joined the parties, the forerunner of Mr. Peter Obi. So his presence assures us that Peter Obi will be here any moment from now. Welcome you with a round of applause. Ezebo, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're here. We are going to move fast and take one audio, or one video from Dr. 
morning, morning. If it's now ready, we have uh, a few seconds to start it. Dr. Maureen Manning. Give him a round of applause in Abstasia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Honored guests, fellow colleagues, delegates, and volunteers, greetings from Boston, USA. I'm Dr. Maureen Manning, and I'm thrilled to be a part of the inaugural Shaping the Future Conference. That thousands are gathered today to celebrate women's rights and to promote ending violence against women speaks volumes about the fact that the future can be favorable for all women. Looking back for over a century, numerous initiatives, acts, and declarations promoting women's rights and calling for an end to gender-based violence have been officially recognized across the world. In 1909, the first National Women's Day on record was held in New York City. In 1975, International Women's Day was recognized by the United Nations. In 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was created. In 1993, the Vietnam Declaration and Program of Action was enacted. And in 2015, the Beijing Platform for Action was established. And yet, According to Ivan Simonovic, the former UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, in his address to the General Assembly a decade ago, violence against women remains the most pervasive expression of discrimination against women and an egregious violation of human rights. Indeed, diverse and persistent forms of violence continue to affect the lives of millions of women worldwide, thus curtailing the whole range of their human rights and empowerment in all aspects of life, whether in public, economic, social, or family sphere. Thus, despite over a hundred years of a child marriage, trafficking, gender-based violence, and women disproportionately are impacted by poverty, war, disease, lack of clean water, and food insecurity. Simonovic argued that there can be no democratic and equal society if half of the world's population remains discriminated and disenfranchised. In fact, throughout history, when women have exercised their right to freedom of expression, assembly, and to participate in public life, many have encountered stereotypes, harassment, and violence. For example, in 2012, when young Palestinian Malala Yousafzai spoke about the atrocities of life under Taliban rule, she was shot by Taliban forces. Miraculously surviving, she became a world-renowned figure in the quest for peace and in the pursuit of equal access actions, paving the way for a more peaceful and prosperous future for women and girls. Each of you gathered here today has demonstrated a desire to shape the future. And over the course of this Shape the Future conference, you will hear from world leaders, experts consider the concepts of ethical leadership, conflict prevention, and peace building. Whether it's peace, equity, or education, or another cause that drives you, find something about which you are passionate and become a voice for change. Malala stated, if we believe in something greater than our lives, then our voices will only multiply. If we stand with others who also want to create a more peaceful future, then our voices will multiply as well. We will be stronger, louder, and more powerful advocates for change. Thank you and best wishes for an inspiring and motivating conference. I have no doubt that each of you will play a role in shaping the world and make it more peaceful, equitable, and just. Lead. 
in this video. Give her a resounding round of applause because I know somewhere, somehow, she is watching this event. Thank you. Quickly, we will take another video which uh, will be as inspiring as this one. This one is coming from Daniel Ops and he will do his presentation now. If it's ready, we'll take it. I'm the president and CEO of AFS Intercultural Programs and I'm joining you today from New York. I was planning on being there with you in person, but unfortunately the security situation made it more difficult to travel. I'm so sorry that I can't be there with you, but I very much hope to be able to come visit you in Nigeria very soon. I'm so delighted to participate in this important event, even just virtually, and I want to give a big shout out to work. I was planning on being there with you in person, but unfortunately the security situation made it more difficult to travel. I'm so sorry that I can't be there with you, but I very much hope to be able to come visit you in Nigeria very soon. I'm so delighted to participate in this important event, even just virtually, and I want to give a big shout out to Noel Alumona for putting on this conference and for your leadership of this amazing organization, Boys Champions. Noel is probably too modest to share with you that he also won the AFS Award for Young Global Citizens this year for his commitment to contributing a more just and peaceful world. We are so inspired by your work, Noel. AFS was founded more than 100 years ago, and our mission is to provide intercultural learning opportunities to help people develop the knowledge, skills, and values needed to create a more just and peaceful world. In short, we're all about developing active global citizens. And I think you will all agree with this. Our world needs more active global citizens. Each of you can be a global citizen too. Being a global citizen is not about stamps in your passport, but it's about your curiosity about issues that affect your community or the world. Being a global citizen is about being able to relate to others across differences and showing empathy. Being a global citizen is about your willingness to take action to, wait, to make the world a more just, sustainable, and peaceful place. And AFS provides a lot of opportunities, and I want to share with you just three ways of how you can participate and become a global citizen. If you're a student, I encourage you to participate in an AFS exchange program for a semester or a year and experience another culture or language or you can apply for a scholarship for our AFS Global STEM Changemakers program. It's a full scholarship focused on science and sustainability as well as global learning. Or participate in an AFS virtual exchange program. It's a great way to meet people from around the world online and to build your global skills. If you're a teacher, apply for the AFS Effect Plus scholarship. It's an online program that gives teachers skills to teach about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have full scholarships available and it benefits your whole classroom. And finally, if you're between 18 and 32 years old, I encourage you to participate in the Youth Assembly. It's one of the biggest platforms in the world that brings together young leaders and change makers. The next Youth Assembly will take place in New York City from August 11 to 13, 2023. And Noel knows all about it. He is on the Youth Assembly Advisory Council and he also serves as a Youth Assembly Ambassador in Nigeria. And I'm excited to share with you today that we have made available five full scholarships for young people from Nigeria to travel to New York and participate in the Youth Assembly. We hope for a big Nigerian delegation at the next AFS Youth Assembly in New York City. You can find out more about all the opportunities that I shared and more opportunities at nigeria.afs.org. And I want to thank all of you who are participating in this event for your commitment to shaping the future. I wish you a wonderful conference and hope to meet you soon in Nigeria or in New York City. Thank you so much and goodbye. Here at Boys Champions live video that's on right now on your various social media handles. Use the hashtag shaping the future or the hashtag STF2022, but particularly hashtag shaping the future. Akam. Thank you very much, Mr. Von Madukwe. Thank you very much, Daniel Ops. Let's give him a round of applause. It was a crystal presentation, an encouragement, and maybe some of us will take advantage of what he publicized in his speech. 
Let's go to another plenary session, the second one, and this one is entitled Opportunities for Youth, Gender Equality and Women Inclusion. And I will take the time to ask a woman, a lady, to be the moderator as scheduled. I want to invite Amanda Elo, who is a seasoned broadcaster and every person who will now moderate. Please give her an encouraging welcome. Thank you very much. Amanda, you're welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here as early as you did. Do not mind my shoe, it's a, it's a gossip on its own. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon everyone. I am uh, Amanda Eloma Obuagwa. I choose to go with Amanda Elo. It's, I think it's easier for a lot of people. Let me start by saying uh, greetings uh, to his eminence, Cardinal of Nikon, and to every other person here. I I'm standing on existing protocol, what protocols Julian respectably observed. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I, I need to say this. I, I am delighted to be in a gathering of youths who are change makers. Bold, wise, enterprising, and most importantly, ordinary youths. Ordinary youths who are doing their best to make Nigeria conducive for themselves. I see you all and I appreciate your presence here today. Thank you so much for coming. Th this is a phenomenal event and uh, I shall do my best to make this conversation as conversational and relative as possible or relatable to every person here. I see children from secondary schools and primary schools. I don't want us to talk so abstractly that they don't understand what we're saying here today. So I'm going to make sure as much as I can because I have amazing people on my panel. So when we start talking, I want every person to feel involved. I want you to know that we have real life problems and we are out to solve those problems as much as we can because we are shaping the future. Before I, 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 I introduce them, I want you to give a round of applause to my panelists, the persons coming up to join this panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so uh, because my Lord the Archbishop already mentioned that uh, the youths are leaders of today, I'm glad that the persons who I'll be talking to, to, with today are youths like youth, we love youth, you know when you say youth, like young people like you and I. I have um, Augustine at you. I want him to come up and tell you who he is by himself. That's how I want to do it. Augustine at you, you're welcome. Please a round of applause for him. Thank you so much. Yes, I also have uh, Roya Montessa. Roya Montessa. Uh, is the lady of the moment, apart from Hafsat, actually. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, finally, I have Godfrey Emory Lebo. You see how he's dressed like a tech guy. That's what I want here. I want us to have conversations, real life conversations that affect us. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And while we're at it, I want to say thank you to Boys Champions. This is not easy. This is amazing. Because if we want to make boys better, if we, sorry, if we want to make women better humans, I think we should start by the kind of men we train around us. If you have good men, then women do not have to fear for their lives or fear for anything. Yes, I feel so. So I'm glad we're having this conversation today. Thank you so much uh, for coming. We are the panel with the responsibility of three distinctive and broad topics, very complex topics. And if you listen, the Archbishop already gave us a warning. Yes, he, he, he warned us before we started. We're talking today on opportunities for youth, gender equality, and women inclusion. Very delicate topic. And that's what we're going to be doing. Now, before I delve into the topic, I'd like you to introduce yourself, Mr. Augustine. Actually, who are you? Let them know, please. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for sticking around until now for this uh, conversation. And I hope uh, the panel and the rest of the program will be as... Uh, uh, interesting uh, as the first panel has uh, was. My name is Augustine Achu. Augustine Chidera Achu. Um, I live in the U.S. I work with a non-profit organization called Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, TAPS for short. 
We provide PBS emotional support for those grieving the loss of a loved one in the U.S. military. But on the other side, I am on an international program where we try to bring... I know Noah will frown if I don't say this. Um, I'm a U.S. Marine and... Uh, and also, I, as we have touched upon here, our education very importantly, if you have noticed, it's an ongoing process. Someone said it's actually life itself. So I'm also doing my uh, PhD in political science, international relations, in one of the best universities in the world, Howard University, Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. I hope one day someone would say Ingham Yazikiwe University, one of the best universities in the world, and we keep moving on. Thank you so much for that. Ruya, let's have you. Hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Royal Montasir and I'm from Libya. I, uh, I've worked back home on different causes such as youth empowerment, empowering the private sector and entrepreneurs, uh, empowering women, um, and conflict resolutions and dialogues um, in Libya. I met Noel in India and uh, from all the places and, uh, and I was honored to be invited here and to be amongst you today and I'm looking forward to this uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Roya. And over to you, Godfrey. Hello, everyone. So, um, I feel like I'm the only Nigerian based in Nigeria on this panel. I'm here, too. Look at me. So, my name is Godfrey Libo. I run a tech startup called Curiosity Exploring. I started sometime last year after the president came out on national television and say that Nigerians will graduate from good universities with good degrees and the government will not be able to provide jobs for them. So that what will provoke us into forming a community of developers that try to tackle real world problems and learn from there. I'm very grateful to be here and I hope that um, we share the future well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So we're starting with opportunities for youths, and I think you all were chosen here for a reason because you are change makers, you're already doing something, right? And so the very first question we have here is how have we provided seats for the young people at the table? I wish we had like a politician here because I'm willing to, I really want to ask that question to a politician, but let's start with all of us here. We have a tech guy, we have a woman empowerment person, we have you who's empowering different youths in different parts of the world. Now when we talk of empowerment, I think Chiki asked that question, what do we even mean? by empowerment. So how have we provided seats for the young people at the table? It could be metaphorical. What have you done for the youths so far? What should uh, we put into consideration as far as putting them on the table is involved? So, well, I know I'm not um, towing uh, Dr. Nkechi's, uh, Professor Nkechi's uh, uh, line on politics on who is a politician. I know I am not a politician by profession. I read political science. I'm studying under political science and all of those things. Before I left Nigeria, I was really active in politics. Um, if you know my roots, you will understand how I, why I said that. But I am sure that creating a space or it, you know, getting the youth to the table demands a particular thing which we can actually decipher and break it down into different things. And what does that mean? It's engagement. The youth, we have been used to this idea that was forced upon us. We didn't, we didn't create that by ourselves. That we are rather instruments of violence rather than instruments of change advocates of positive change. So we have always been used to that idea that we can, we only come in when, you know, the guy on the top says, oh, I don't like this. This result is not in my favor. And then we come in and, you know, do the buhaha and all of those things. We've been used to that. But that is not engagement. And that is not how we get to the table. And I believe for the past few months now, we have seen, or we are seeing something, resemblance that looks like what we should be doing. And we should all recognize the fact that 
they say power is not given it is what is taken and it's easier for us to take power but we have to recognize that so to create that opportunity on the table i would say as my own opening speech is staying engaged or first of all being engaged staying engaged and never back out because guess what mr frank Wenke knows this as much as the general and your eminence they will always want to force us out if you don't know now know it they will want to frustrate us that we don't have the money they will want to frustrate us that we don't have the what who can tell me that structure the structure what else what other structure do you need other than go register and have a voter's card you they will want to frustrate us with that but say what no so we come to the table determine oh don't mistake it some of our youth will also sell us out but when they get there and sell us out what do we do we recall them the power is in our own hands so let us create the opportunity for ourselves to get to the table stay at the table when they want to frustrate us we tell them we are not going nowhere for what tomorrow is what today so pretty much get engaged stay engaged and so what do not back down from being engaged all right thank you so much for that one round of applause for him please Ray, I, would, I would like to ask you next but i would like to skip you for a reason because yes i'm coming for you let's go to the tech guy so you're in tech and we've got youths so many of them we're talking on employment we're talking of people transitioning from this to that in order to make ends meet so i want to know what have you done you as um a tech startup manager that's who you are right you yes what have you done so far for the youth around you okay, um, I, I think that's the best question anybody has asked me in a while oh my god so <laughs> all right so sometime last year um the president came out on national television and said you graduate from Nigerian universities and have good degrees and the government will not be able to provide jobs for you. And it hit me personally because I have a lot of friends. Um, I kind of grew up in the north and then I started working in Lagos first and then I worked in Onitsha too. So kind of, I kind of have a cycle of friends around the country. And so I spoke with my co-founder, he's sitting somewhere behind though. And I asked, how do we be part of the solution? How do we come in now and try to solve problems? Because at that point, I was um, working for like three companies. I'm head of research and development for a New York company called Yokumbo. And then they are saying in Nigeria that you will not have jobs even if you graduate from school. So what, what's that? So we created a Google form. That's how we started trying to solve the problem. We created a Google form that said, hey, you want to be part of a group of a community of people that don't care about your current level of education, your age, the skin color you have, or whether you're smart or not smart. You want to be part of this group of developers. Then send this form and let's form a community. And in less than three days, we had 283 people sign up from 27 out of the 36 states in Nigeria and um, about six other foreigners from Africa and then Europe. And it was amazing because initially I didn't think we would have that kind of number. I was thinking like 10, you know. So from there we started from the very rudiments. Um, in Sound of Music they say that the best way to start is to start from the very beginning. And that's where we started. So the concept of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the things you need to be a programmer. So that's how we started, and we kept going. But now, in the context of solving real world problems, so if we want to learn something, we look at a problem in society, and then from that point, we start asking ourselves, what do we need to know so that we can build this? And we keep building until we get it to finish. So that's what we've done. Okay. And that's impressive. Thank you so much. Round of applause for him, please. Amazing. Roya, <laughs> you, are, you, you work with women, right, as far as empowerment is concerned. It is one thing to be a youth, 
and it is another to be a woman who is a youth. I don't want to add black. Let's leave that part. But let me, let me ask you, how has it been for you as a woman who is trying to empower other women? What do you see? How, how, how does it go for you and how does it go for those women you try to work with? Um, well, excellent question. Thank you, Amanda. You're I welcome. can say that it's not easy. It's not easy being a woman, Chris. <laughs> And then being a woman who is ambitious, a woman who um, wants to build a career in a, in a culture, because my, my culture and, and society is similar to yours, so I understand the struggles, or at least some of the struggles. Um, I think that um, it's, it's important for women to inspire and to also be empowered to make the change, whether it was in a in a company or in a, as an influencer or as a as a activist in the society, and I will start by saying a real life story that I am one of the I'm basically one of the the see I told you yeah I feel you <laughs> I am the uh, the 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 one woman in my company that is ahead of the department. Wow. The youngest. Now that's not easy. You would think people um, trying to make assumptions about how you got there or how you are in the, way, the place that you are. Yeah. But that's, don't let that affect you. You got there because you deserve it. You got there because you are worth it. And I think it's very important to highlight the, the, the importance of boys and men to support this because I think this is a very it's a, it's a very interesting thing to discuss gender roles in general because you see it's not just uh, um, an, a fight for women it's also a fight for men because you see hi guys you have sisters you have mothers you have daughters so that's also a fight for you and your family and your loved ones for you to make and I think we t that the idea of, of, of Educating and enlightening boys and men to support that cause is very, very important. And I, I think it starts with, because it starts with communication uh -huh. and, and fruitful dialogue, because that's how it goes. It's not an argument between me and, and him. Yeah. It's not that, I, that's not how you resolve or go to a conclusion that, uh, that is effective. The, the, the dialogue should go as a communication, a conversation that we both wish to, um, to conclude to something that will help us both to hold our places in the society and I think this is very but this is the, the key this is the key to to how this should work and to, to make a successful um, you know result of the conversation okay so I'm, I'm going to a round of applause for Hafiz I'm going to move to the next one which is basically gender-based violence and all of that but I need, like I said, I am interested in persons here understanding what we're saying. And there is somebody here who's watching this who's saying, I want to be like Roya. There's somebody watching right now who wants to be like Augustine. There's somebody looking at the tech guy who wants to be like the tech guy. So before we delve into gender, because it's always a buzz boost thing, you know, before we delve into uh, gender talk, I want each of you to maybe tell people just quickly some of your greatest challenges in your field and how you were able to surmount these problems and you're standing tall today. Let's start with your ghosting. Well, uh, in my field, uh -huh. I'm in many, I'm in, I'm in a lot of field. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you, let me just, you know, let me just put it out there. You know, when you are in the military, when they say field, <laughs> It's, it's really wild out there. Oh. But in the real wild world, you know, it's always a field, right? And the challenges that I faced, that I am still currently facing, because some of them, you know, they come in different shapes and forms. Uh -huh. uh, they, they, still, they, they remain the same, and they are peculiar to each and every one of you. I was like you. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, don't, don't, don't be deceived by this. I was, I was somewhere like you before I got to this. And that's what I always tell people. If I, if I, if I can, can, can get to this, it's only, it's only a matter of time and, and the right, right calculations. So why I'm saying this is because since 2008, I have been in tertiary institution. The only time off I had was when I went to NYSC, 2013-2014. 
And when I graduated with my second master's degree, 2009, uh, 2019 to 2020, that was my only time off from school, from university. So my challenges has been around getting myself sharpened up to become who I am. And some of those challenges, that's why I said, is the same thing that you are facing, you're passing through. Being able to be consistent. We always hear this word about consistency, right? But it is not easy to, to, to demand of yourself to be consistent. I can easily say, come on, can you be consistent for once? If you say you're gonna do this, why don't you do it? But how about yourself? You have to go to school, you have an exam, and all of those things. How consistent are you in studying? It's a challenge to sit down to study, especially when you have a lot of things. Because even before I graduated from my from uh, undergrad in Imo State University, I already started a business. I started an event management business. I was making cakes, decorating places, and planning weddings, and whatever thing you can, like some event. I was doing all of those things and at the same time studying. So how do I become consistent in my study? Because at that, I mean, a few months ago that I changed my, my, my career path, which is a very, another thing that you have to understand. You may not be able to figure it all out, but just one step at a time, incremental steps. A few months ago, I said start, a few months ago, I wanted to be who? I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to teach, and that's why you see me bachelor's, one master's, two master's, now a PhD. I mean, it's impressive. so I wanted to do all of these things, but I have to remain consistent in order to go through all of those. Okay. So for that, you, if you remain consistent, have real, realistic plans. Okay. Don't, don't give in to peer pressure. You may be able to get there, not exactly how you want it, but then it will pay off. But then as a practitioner, you have the challenges of dealing with other people. People of your age, people below you, and people above you. How are you able to manage the consistency of the relationship that you have with them? You find out that in everything is about consistency, especially in our today's world, where a man that is maybe as a, as, as a, as a 30 something year old guy, a man that is just like 10 years above you wants you to like, fall down on the floor before he could actually accept your resume is your CV to even submit. How do you manage that relationship and yourself, you know, giving a helping hand as, as little as you think you are, you can give a helping hand. And how do you deal with your own peers? All of these things are all calculated steps, incremental enough for you to get to a level. So if you can manage these challenges, as I am trying my best to do, because they will always be there. If I went through them, if I am still going through them, my brother, you will even go through more. And for that reason, I would say, consistency is the biggest challenge that I have to face. And I'm not saying this because I'm the master consistent. No, but because I tried my best, huh? Mm -hmm. And I think my best is paying off gradually. So if you could use through my own eyes of the way I manage consistency, I, I dealt with my, 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 my consistency issues, not because you know exactly as I did it, but knowing that it could be done. I, I guess you can surmount that challenge. All right, thank you so much. Uh, consistency. I've had consistency over intensity any day, wherever you are. So keep trying. Uh, Roya, let's talk about you, your challenge so far with, you know, how have you done uh, it? I would like to start by saying, believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. As youth, we have a lot of doubts. And these doubts are confirmed by all, this, the, all around us, by elders who are in power, who are telling us, no, you cannot be where I am today because I know better, because I have more experience, because I am wiser. And that's true, and they are. And that's why I want to just uh, follow on the, what the bishop said, that we need to show them the way out. We need to prove ourselves. Because you see, if we want power, and power comes with great responsibilities, we, ne we need to, we need to uh, prove that we are there, that we can lead. And that's, I think, as youth, we take sometimes, we take for granted because not, not just because we're youth, then 
by you know that therefore we means that we need to be that we need to educate ourselves we need to empower ourselves by ourselves and by elders who are I don't want to call them elders because I think that's a bit rude <laughs> but I want to call them wise wiser wise people who can we can learn from them and then after we will learn from them and after we prove to them that we are up to the challenge then we can nicely show them the way out and I think I just want to follow back on the fact that I think believing in ourselves is really really important and having all of these doubts all of that inner voices in our head telling us that no you cannot be what you want to be is something very frustrating and that's why I would like to to ask everybody here today do you think do you believe that you can actually like really you can make the change that you want if you do like uh, raise your hand do you actually think okay good <laughs> To good. some extent, really yes, good. very good. Yeah. I think that's very important and I think we need to surround ourselves by people who can empower us and tell us that yes, by parents who will tell us that okay, you want this, then there you go. Disciplines, by, by teaching us all of these values for us to pursue what we want and pursue it in the right way. Over, over so, yeah. to you right now. Thank you so much, Roya, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm very impressed with the answers already. I think they've said all the things I was supposed to say. <laughs> So I'm going to use um, practicals now to try to answer my own uh -huh. questions. Uh -huh. The challenges we face and how we are trying to summon them. Um, so sometime when we started, at some point we noticed that um, interest was waning in our community. And so how do we bring that interest back? Um, we ended up learning how to build cryptocurrency tokens. And we built a Mori coin under the Solana blockchain. As a way of um, sending incentivized tokens to people inside the community when they do assignments, you get um, it worked amazing because it sparked back the interest that was waning, and people started learning how to code faster. People were um, more engaged. People were trying to unblock their fellow friends because remember this: we are a community of people from various backgrounds and ages. You see. So I have my small cousin who is about four years or five years old inside. I also have my mom inside, you see, and lecturers as well. So it's, it's amazing. You have to figure out a way to bring people's interests together. That's one of the things we did. Now, immediately we jumped into blockchain, it became more exciting because before they said we, we were just hearing blockchain like Bitcoin and, and just that. But once we got there, we started seeing that the world would become a better place if more applications were built on the blockchain because it's more trustworthy, it's more transparent. And so the next thing we started doing was thinking about how to migrate applications that were already built into the blockchain. We, we, we were successful in migrating Raven. Raven was more like, think about it like an e-commerce platform. Well, we were able to migrate it into a 3.0, which makes it a blockchain application. And how that works and the advantages that has is, it's mind-blowing. Because now a shop owner inside the platform owns his or her account. So depending on your rating, your reviews, your history, um, and the things you, you could will you have and all, you can decide to sell your shop. It is your own. So you have freedom. The next thing we did was um, um, we looked at a chat platform we were trying to build and learn from. We called it Explorer. Now, the Explorer, I think about it like something like WhatsApp. But we now decided that these new skills we've learned, which is um, the blockchain thing, let's try to add it into this application. And what we ended up doing was build um, an application that your chat can become a story. You own your chat. So your chat can become a story. Instead of WhatsApp and probably selling out to your chats, you have the right to sell it yourself. So if you think that the content you generate um, makes a whole lot of sense, you can click a button and make it into an NFT. What NFT is, is non-fungible token. And for that reason, you can sell it out. Like, if you feel like it, you see, you can sell it out and be like, hey, so is there anyone interested in this kind of story? I have a story to sell. And you can sell it and get money from it. Your own money, not us now, not like the organization like what WhatsApp does. And um, 
the part, and I think this is the biggest thing we are doing right now, is um, so we on the YouTube channel. Of course, we were training people. Why shouldn't we? And in that YouTube channel, there were sessions where we do tutorial videos, and um, we also owned another um, part, like a playlist, where we talk about issues in Nigeria. Remember, we were provoked into existence when the president said, you will graduate and government will not be able to provide jobs for you. So we had this session, this playlist up where we talk about issues in Nigeria and how we feel we can use the power of debt to solve that problem. And um, on one of the videos, we talked about um, the election system in Nigeria, uh -huh. how the way it's structured and the way it's built it's not right for a lot of reasons. Number one, why will you finish election in Nigeria and you have to wait for three or four days before collisions happen? When a JavaScript function can do that with just one line of code and in a split second, and then you expect all the vice chancellors Abi, to go to Abuja in this bad road. I traveled from Abuja to here and we were knocked, like they hit us like four or five times. Our bumper is broken, we are trying to fix it. The roads in Nigeria are terrible. Now, how do you expect, how do you expect, what happens to those um, vice chancellors that are coalition officers when they are traveling on other route? Like, it, it was not making any sense. And so, we had this video of trying to reach out to INEC and say, hey, so we think the current system you have is not very good. We might be able to do something better if we translate this into a web three platform because it becomes more trustworthy. It becomes more transparent. It is on a blockchain, so everybody sees exactly what is happening. Here's the funny thing to it. Like, in less than two days after that video was up, our YouTube channel was completely dropped, suspended. And we reached out to YouTube and said, hey, so um, we've not broken any of your rules yet. Can you bring back our channel? Because even though, if you might have issues with that video, there are other videos that we've put in so much manpower to build, and people are actually learning from it from across the world. Can you bring back our channel? And we also added this that because YouTube says on their and terms and conditions that the only reason your channel will be suspended is if um, if you have three strikes, like if you if you break their rules and you have three in less than ninety days. So we added this and said, hey, so we've not broken no, anyone yet. That's number one. Number two, even if we have broken, we've not broken three. Number three, it's not 90 days yet. Can you bring back our channel? And YouTube reached back to us and said, we've, we've seen your appeal. And your account is still suspended. Oh. To have that kind of comment, so I'm, I'm trying to answer your question correctly. Mm -hmm. To have that kind of comment come from YouTube, um, we felt like Google was the center of everything tech you see so to have that kind of comment come from youtube is it was terrible for us because it meant that the tech world is not where it should be yet it does not have that freedom that democracy yet because here we are trying to solve a problem and then you're dropping our channel so we can't and so we decided this is how we decided to move forward we went all super rigorously and decided to build a platform that looks like YouTube. We are in the process of doing it. We know it's heavy, we know it's good. We know that it's too much work for us, but come on, why shouldn't we? Why should we? At least we should give it a try and give us the best shot we can. And we are doing an amazing job there because it has um, more important things than what I think the current YouTube has because you as the account owner of um, a channel on the platform will have the right to do everything. Unlike YouTube, you will not have to wait until you have um, 4,000 watch hours and 1,000 subscribers before you start earning royalty from your channel. From the very start, as you are doing things on the channel, you start earning your cryptocurrency while you are on the platform. What's the name of the platform again? We are still working on it, but we okay, okay. tend to call it Grasp. Okay. And it's amazing because um, we that has gotten the attention of fcdo that's foreign common world um what's that development office um, they organized a global symposium last year in um, last month october and they invited us and we told them about it they've seen some of the things we are doing and they are so amazed about it and want to host the next symposium 
on our platform. So here's my answer to the question you asked. And my challenges always comes, like it always comes. You have to have the mindset that makes you get used to those challenges. Like let your mind be such that, okay, well, um, they will come. The beauty of living is how do you keep growing from them and learn from it? Okay. That's my answer. Thank All you. right, thank you so much. How, how you build amazing things from your challenges. You know, you turn your, your sorrow to joy. That's amazing. Let's move now to gender conversations. We're going to be taking your questions very soon, but let's, uh, uh, let's just, you know, say something really quick because I, I feel, I feel we've, we've, we've spent a lot here. Quickly, we're talking about gender. We're talking about the boy child. We're talking about the girl child. We've had women accept some things. I was in a car the other day and a woman said, see, if your man cheats, is not a problem. The problem is he should not show you who he's cheating with. This person is comfortable with this life. Yes. And she was telling me that. We've had people, we've had women tell men, you don't cry, you don't do this. And these things are part of the problem, foundational issues. I want us to quickly, please, because we do not have time. Each and every one of us, how do you think we can end violence and discrimination against women? That's it. You can have... I believe that um, the issue of um, ending gender-based violence is um, it's, it's a commitment for all. It's not a it's not a one-man thing. It's not a match for uh, for women. It's not a campaign for just um, young ladies or something like that. It is it is a it's an all hands on deck kind of a thing. But more especially, there's something Noel started, which is boys' champion, and. Um, I think he's trying to turn their attention to something that is, you know, non-conventional, which is the idea that, do you know if we actually get the boys all right, it will be a lot more easier for the society to thrive. It will, it will be a lot more easier for ladies, for the, for the girl child to thrive in the society. And that is my own, because I'm a man. And I totally agree that some of the things that my sister as a as a as a girl child roya and 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 you know anyone that is a female here i may not understand the thing the way you the way you're seeing it and the same with the way i see it but from my own standpoint as a man i have to make what an enabling environment something roya mentioned it is not an argument it is a conversation and for that sake as a guy, as a boy, as a man, however you want to identify yourself as a dude, you have to be able to consciously, I mean it by the word consciously, you have to consciously know that the world is already skewed to your favor. Mm -hmm. I asked a friend of mine this question one time. I, I said, do you know that I haven't, I haven't seen that religion? I haven't seen that religion that doesn't have a, a male figure up there. It's always uh, we don't know we don't know what God looks like, right? So we, we painted God with this white old man with big beard, beard, right? Why didn't we say this white old woman with I don't know no hair on her head? You know, you know the Buddhists, the Muslims, everything is about the man. The man is is a patriarchal world, no matter how much you want to say. Even when you go to those uh, uh, traditions that um, that the women can marry more than uh, 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 one man, it's still you know a man at the top somehow. So as a man, you have to consciously recognize that that the world has been skewed to your favor, and because the world has been skewed to your favor already, you should be making an enabling environment for conversations that will enable the advancement. Hey, check it out. Hmm? You will get married one day. Oh, I don't want to be married. I want to be like uh, his eminence. There's no problem. You will be dealing with reverend sisters and uh, nuns. Uh, uh, no, you know what? Let me just remain celibate. Well, the world is not made of only men. So whichever way you turn, there's a woman right there that needs recognition. And don't be mistaken also. At some point, the woman will be your organ. The woman will be your organ does not mean 
that you have to find a way to fight her you have to recognize it at all times mm. because see it is not with the gender based violence and the gender issues that we're talking about it's not about um onion when you go how much do you have no <laughs> It's not about uh, no. It's about the realities of life. As a man, you already as just the moment you drop like this, you already your social capital is a certain level. As against that of a woman, no matter how rich you are as a woman, no matter how poor you are as a man, the society just sees us differently. And for that reason, they are ene that enabling environment is needed create that conversation don't go making arguments and critiquing how it should be and how it should not be it's actually a conversation get into conversations with your fellow see i'm i'm tired of the fact of let's bring them to the table let's tell them let's ask them how to come to the table because they, on how to get themselves there that's impressive thank you so much uh, let's 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 have um let's have godfrey talk i want you to end it let's have godfrey godfrey please how do we end it as a tech guy <laughs> Because I know you, you, you have ladies there with you. How do, how do we do something about women, please? I don't know. Ah, my brother. <laughs> okay, so um, to be more serious, yeah. I feel like the tech gives us opportunity to, be, um, to have equality and freedom. I feel like um, when you wear a coat, the coats are zeros and ones at the end of the day, and everything is equal at the end. So... Um, <laughs> You write codes, but whatever code you write, they are always yes, equal with the one a woman will write. So no there's supposed to be equality. So my answer to that question is let all of us go to tech and we should be able to ah. have equality. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, tech the equalizer. Let's have you now, uh, Roya. Uh, well, this is a very triggering topic to a lot of people gender equality, role genders, gender roles, and all of that. Uh -huh. So I think the best way to tackle it is. Ladies, let's imagine you are, were born a guy, a man in this world. Do you think you would let everything that you were just given by nature, just so convenient to you, up so easily? You would let all of your rights, the, 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 the privilege that you have, let go of it so easily? Well, then, then that's how you can understand why men are so reluctant to give it us up. But, let's go to men. Gentlemen, hey, um, let's imagine you're a woman. How would you deal with all of your rights being questioned, all of your day-to-day uh, -day life being, um, you know, scrutinized and questioned and um, minimized, your, your basic needs being asked if they're needed or not for you, and all these questions, would you be okay with that? Do you think you can relate? Do you think you can, you want, would want to change the way that women are now asking for change? So that is the real question. Because you were just, it's a 50-50% that you will become, you will be born a woman or a man. So if you were just lucked out, and I don't want to be, because that's the thing, if I was, um, I asked myself this, if I can choose what gender do I want to be, I would still be a woman. Because you know why? Because I think that if I was a man, I would be so privileged and so blinded by that privilege that I would not see. I will, okay, I don't want to see. I don't want to say an idiot, but I will. Yeah, borderline. <laughs> because I will not see what I can see as a woman. I will not be exposed to the to the. I don't want to say suffering because I don't want to dramatize something an experience for all women. But we do suffer. We do. Um, you know, we do go through it. Uh -huh. So, I, w I would not go through it if I was a man. And that's something that I appreciate. And because of that, I ask that question for every man to consider. If you were a woman, how would you deal with that? And if for every woman to, to understand why men are being so reluctant to, to give up that power. So, yeah. Thank All you. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. 
apparently, I know, I know some people will be complaining, why do we keep talking about the women? If you've been with a good man before, if you've been in a company of good men before, you'd understand why we should have this conversation. There are women who are suffering, and I don't understand why, because I grew up with good men. And I, I want us to have these conversations over and over again till everybody understands that this is their responsibility and make it conducive for not just the women, for themselves. Because if you give that leveling ground from the foundation, you can express yourself as a man, you can do what you we, we will no longer expect you to just bring money to the table. We would expect more from the man. When they ask, what can a man bring to the table? A lot of people do not know. Some say money, money. I think you can do more than that. So it is when you start treating us well, if you start treating the women around you well, the child, the girl child around you well, that will begin to understand the value you as a man are embedded with. I, I hope we make Nigeria a better place. Uh, John F. Kennedy would say, do not think of what the government will do for you, but what you do for the government. But that is in a working system. I'm sorry if I've, I've offended anybody. We have the responsibility, because we've talked of opportunities for youth, we have the responsibilities, you and I have the responsibility of making this country a better place. So whatever you do today, wherever you are, please strive to represent, to make it better, all right? Because we would have the next group of leaders emanate from us. And if we don't make it better for them, nobody will make it for us. Thank you so much for joining us here. And I thank my panelists. It's been amazing having you here. Thank you so much for joining me. Once again, I'm Amanda Elo, and I want you to enjoy every bit of this conference. God bless you. Oh, yes, we, 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 we couldn't take questions. Apparently, it seemed uh, everything we said, we've exhausted a lot of things. So, Vaughn is coming up next for that. <laughs> Please appreciate them, put your hands together for them. You know, it's amazing. Okay, so don't forget the social media thing. How many of you have done it? Okay, the group photo, please come back for the group photo. I don't know if any of you have done the, the social media thing. Have you done that? Anybody who's tweeted or retweeted or shared? If you don't, let me see your hands up. Okay, now it's amazing. So continue to do that. Remember, it is at Boys Champion on Facebook, on Instagram, and then on, on Twitter as well. Don't forget to use the hashtag Shaping the Future or STF2022. Okay? We recognize the presence of all the students up there. Please say hi. Hi. Good. We didn't forget you. You're Thank still you. part of us. Thank you. Emory. I like the way you're dressing. You came as you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please a round of applause for them once again. Let's see the crew. Darling. Thank you. We shall now introduce the Senulumba Secondary School students to this event we call Shaping the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause as they stream into the hall. The Semenumba Secondary School students are here. Eddie and Felix, who are best of friends, we are faced with the problem of accommodating each other's behavior. Eddie tries to lead Felix astray by trying to deceive him. Watch out and see what happens. Felix, yes. look at, I've got 5,000 followers on Instagram. I'm not interested in this, please. Eddie, leave me. I want to study my book, please. I'm not interested. Felix, don't make me angry. Don't make me angry. Look at this scene now. This is what I'm going to be doing on chemistry. Acid, base, and salt for now. Let's go in and study more. I've been telling you, I've not been understanding what this man has been teaching since. Then look at this thing. Follow me, follow me now. Come, let me teach you. No, I'm not interested. I have listened to you. You're not interested. Ah, leave me now. I'll be going. I'm going. Eddie, I've warned you about drugs, Eddie. Eddie, stop it. Eddie, stop doing drugs. Eddie, I'm your friend, Eddie. Don't talk to me. You don't follow me on Instagram. You're telling me let us go and read chemist. Follow me if you want me to join and read chemist. You are your own. Felix was interrupted by Eddie and his gang. They forced him to write the exams for them. Sit tight to get the details. Five years later. Uh, Williams, uh, please, 
I don't know how to write these assignments, please. Um, I'm f taking me a lot of time to write these assignments. Please, can you help me? <coughs> Eddie, what's your problem? What's my problem? Eddie, please. Problem? Please, 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 excuse us. Please, Eddie. I want to teach you how things are done. This is not what you wear in campus. These are rats. You need to join the society. You're just low class. You don't know what this is. You know what this is? It can cost you a fortune. Eddie, st stop this nonsense. Me? Nonsense? Stop this nonsense. How is this nonsense? I'm trying to teach you the way. You need to learn. You need to learn. These are not clothes. These are rags. I will not let you insult me from my friend. Please. This is a bag of salt. No, William. William. Please. 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 Yes. I will you know like how this is? is? So Williams, let's go, let's go. You let's, know what this is? Williams. Not all this type of nonsense when you have to Shut up. You can't do anything. Let's just go. Let's go. Eddie and his friends dialogue on a girl in campus, Sandra, who Eddie lost for. He later laments on his slow grades in school. Sandra, hey, Jesus, she likes on Instagram. She did hey. not fine. This guy is not fine. Uh, this guy is competing with the video. Oh, and no, 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 this guy is not fine. This guy is competing with the video. Hey, Jesus. Imagine say, I feel if I get this guy now, eh, and snap it with her now, I'll be on the video's level. Leave this guy. You get? Understand, she understand. She's not fine. She's not Which one do you have? Shift. You don't have anyone that's saying this one is not fine. Don't get your own before you say this one is not fine. See, there's another thing I want to tell you. See, my, I checked my last semester results. My grades are not smiling. You're not even helping. You told me that if I join you, you help me. See, see my, my last semester results. Have you seen Kayovas? You don't want me to graduate, eh? Will we remain here? Are we going to remain here? No, I'm not going to remain here. You see that guy, Felix. You are not ashamed. You see that guy, Felix. Felix, yes. oh, the class rep. Yeah, we are going to go to you. Oh, Felix, Felix can help us. You write our exams for us. Yeah, I just find some, some money and give him. Money. Money is not a problem. Money is not a problem. You're you know, you know, you know, the campus yet. now. Money is not a problem. Yeah. See, tomorrow we'll go and meet the guy. Yeah. Who is he? Yeah. Who goes? Let's, let's go. Let's go. Tomorrow we'll meet him. Tomorrow. Meet tomorrow things. Ah, uh, no pee. Felix is bent on the issue of Eddie and finds a new best friend, Williams. Eddie learns of this and mocks Felix along the way. Williams, I just love my girls this semester and um, I'm not feeling so cool about this. Um, what about you? It's nice. I feel like everything is okay. I think that I've just been sound. It's going well, like. Like good, this, sir. Um, yeah, I'm doing well in my subjects. Like seriously, this guy. I'm doing better than you are sitting here. Fine, fine, girls. This can't put safe. Jesus, I'm doing better. Jesus, like doing better. Like excellent food. Like, this. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, what's your food? Why would not they? Why would not they push front? Is it because I don't? No, because they only me come this side. Okay. Oh, because my boy is there. What am I feeling? Like? What am I feeling like? I'm feeling like your boss. I'll, I'll pull up the right door. She, 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 I came, I came here in peace, so should I like cigar for you? I came here in peace. Uh -huh. Now I came to tell you that you should just prepare a space. That you, you'll be writing my next semester exam. Are you hearing me? You don't have no option. Just let her come and collect clothes and change. Come and collect money and change this your rag. Like you can change your wardrobe, yeah? Let her come and collect money. Do you even have bank account? Are you up to it? And then come, let's go. Let her things. I will, I will, I will. Shut up. 
I'm going to do it this girl. 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 What goes around comes around. Eddie, after experiencing some symptoms, meets his doctor to know the cause. Indeed, seeing is believing. <coughs> nah, this this cough, even cough syrup, not the help. <coughs> uh, dog, this is a, a hospital, in a clinic. Mr. Eddie, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Sit, sit. Dog, welcome. Ah, before you shake me, take permission. Take permission from me. See, take permission from me now. I think your number one illness is bad guys like this. Hey, please leave the office. Leave the office. I'm going to call my security. I see. Take me. Hey, hey, hey. Leave the office. I should leave the office. Leave the office. Thank you. Stay in the office. Dog, dog. You don't do. You. You're welcome. Dog, this is your, this your hospital. Excuse How many years? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Now. Why are you taking oxygen away? Shh. Hey, your number one sickness is this. Doctor, oxygen. Oh. This is not oxygen. Why do you call this an oxygen? You are not seeing the smoke. That is oxygen. This is just paper. Now, you're suffering you from cirrhosis. Cirrhosis of the liver. Zero. Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis. <sighs> Stop making noise. See, I've been to the States and there's nothing like cirrhosis in their English. Hey, let me just cut this short. Within the next two years, you're going to die. That's the end. Gadat, see this one. We were on campus. You came to me seeking for advice, and now you're telling me nonsense. Doctor, is it me that you are ready in university? Shit. See, wait, wait. Let me tell you. See, I'm not a woman. See, I am a man. I'm well aware of that. You are well aware of that, yeah. and you are telling me that I will die. You're going to die, Eddie. That on the campus. You take drugs. The whole uni lad for me. Alcohol. This piece of shit here. Nah, that's not good. So even your own hospital safe, you need to see the chairs we are using. Yeah, you can give me some money well so I can do some innovation. See the problem with Nigeria, I should give you money. Okay. And you're telling me I'm going to die. Same person now that will give you money. Yeah, you're going to die. Please, don't even disturb me. See, I'm sorry. You don't have the problem, you don't have the solution to my problem. Sorry about I'm that. not giving you money. Give me. See see this one, you send telling me I'm going to die. Well, you're going to die. So go back to your hospital now. See, tell him. Oh, now money. Do you need money? Hey, Mr. Okay, Eddie, okay, you are going okay, to die. Okay, okay. See, or I send your account number. Okay. But just make sure you go miss drug. Okay, thank you. Why did you come out? This girl. I've got to meet you. Your friend can be your enemy someday. A little misunderstanding arises between Eddie and Caesar, which causes them to part ways. Years later, Eddie finally realizes his mistakes and comes to his senses and melts with Felix to reconcile and ask for help. It is never too late to turn a new leaf. Snakes too shed their skin. Watch closely. Stressing me out. I'm feeling rough. I'm feeling so rough. Oh God. Ah. Hey, come in. Yeah, come in. Come in. Ah, who's there? Eddie. What are you doing here? No, I don't want to listen to you. Please, please just leave my office. I want you to leave my office. I mean, get out of my office. Get out. I mean, leave my office. You, you, you can't hear me. You should leave my office. After you saw me, you won't. No, get out.
we used to be good friends from childhood, but <coughs> I was turned away by campus life. I knew I made a mistake and I regret it. I'm very sorry. All these are vanity. I, I discovered too late. And now the doctor said I'm having zero. I don't even understand. Talk, talk, please. Kill me, please. I don't think. See, I know I've wronged you in all aspects, but I think to aid his man and to forgive his divine. Please, please forgive me. Uh, Eddie, you made me God. Eddie, Eddie, you, you destroyed my life. Eddie, I will. I hate shit. Dog, it was out of. You made me look like a dog. That was what they told me in university was like, you have to be the dog and I have to be the master. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it was just university life. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I love you as a friend. Yes, I know. I need to make amends, dog. I warned you. <laughs> Change your ways. Change your ways, Eddie. Please, just forgive me. Please. Please. All my business, all my my drugs, everything has crashed. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. In fact, I've been disowned by my dad. Please forgive me. I believe that you can find this place. It is in your heart to forgive me, dog. Please. I'm so sorry. Please. These were two friends who had the same opportunity in life. We as youths we have the same opportunity too. We all have to make ample use of the time we have. We have to make the right decisions. We have to know the kind of friends we follow, which is the most important. Drug abuse is a social vice that has, that has haunted our youths and our country at large. We have to say no to that. Also, we have to remain faithful in every decision we take. We have to remain immovable. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may we give them a resounding round of applause. They have done well, and I'm sure you enjoyed it. That man, that young boy, who, the actor, he is not the boy, who is said to be dying in the next two years, I think he truly has some cough. Honestly, because the way he was coughing showed that uh, he may be needing a doctor any moment from now. Well, thank you very much. We are going to have another show, but this time within a very spe short space of time. And I want to welcome the group that we call Adanta Troop. They are coming for a performance within the GFA. Please give them a welcoming round of applause as they come into the stage to take control of matters. I want to once again thank the boys champions for creating a wave in Nigeria. This is a great wave. I have not seen anything organized apart from political gatherings that enjoyed this mammoth crowd. Please put your hands together to encourage them more. The conference shaping the future conference 2022 in Nigeria. I do hope that Noah will find the heart to organize this again in Nigeria next year. But he's shaking his head. But I know whether it's positive or negative, something will be organized to attract these young people and influence their lives. Thank you so much indeed. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Adanta too. They are here.
and for the dancers no matter how you love these dancing skills practice it with caution otherwise you go to a pedic anytime all right once again i am grateful to both champions for this very exciting moment of my life and i know you are also going through that we are going to get something but let me tell you um, Mr. Ozibo left here to bring in Mr. Peter Obi. Thank you. And let me assure you, any moment from now, he will be coming in. If I give instruction that if he comes in, nobody should say anything, will you obey? <laughs> All right, no problem. Please yourself and be happy always. But then we shall go into a plenary before he comes in. Let me now tell you that the next topic we are going to discuss is ethical leadership, conflict prevention, and peace building. Within the 45 minutes we have now, hoping that Mr. Peter B will not come in within that time, I want to invite a very ex-radio broadcaster a fine speaker and also an authoritative anchor on radio, Radio Nigeria. I want to invite Mr. Vaughan Mwadukwe to come as a moderator, give him the land of applause he deserves. He will take care of the rest and introduce his uh, persons he's going to work with. Thank you, Mr. Vaughan Mwadukwe. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Some of you may not know that Mr. Aka Ezaka happens to be my boss at the office. But today we are friends. Good afternoon, everyone, again. So it feels different sitting down here right now. 
and walking up and down and uh, it feels a lot different sitting down here but i'm glad to be here this afternoon i'm sure that uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes it's going to be as interesting as the previous um, you know panels had been now many opinions have it that uh, you know, the heart of the problem between Nigeria and other developing nations, you know, like ours, is leadership. And when they say leadership, it's at all levels of it. And, um, you know, leadership goes beyond just being number one on the list. Most times, when you have a group of persons gathered together and they say, who's your leader? It's the person's name that's usually uh, reaching at the first, uh, at the top of that list. But you go beyond that, um, the leadership is directed by respect for ethical beliefs and values and for the dignity and rights of others. It is thus related to concepts such as trust, honesty, consideration, charisma, and fairness. And without these elements, it is believed that all facets of development cannot be actualized and development, you know, also thrives in an environment uh, devoid of conflicts where peace uh, thrives. Are these elements present in the leadership patterns we have experienced in Nigeria? How can we, through this pattern of leadership, avoid all manner of conflicts that have affected us and help to develop our communities? I'm not going to be alone. As usual, there will be panelists who will be joining me you know, on the stage right now. Uh, I guess I'm intimidated by the, the, uh, you know, the charisma and capabilities of those who will be joining me on this platform. Please make welcome, please make welcome, retired General Chris Esse to please join me on stage. Put your hands together for him. The MC had tried to, you know, do a bit of introduction for him earlier on, uh, but when he sits down, uh, we'll pass the mic to him to do another, you know, introduction for himself, this time from his own point of view. You're welcome. You're welcome, sir. Please, a round of applause for him again, retired General Eze. Uh, usually, I don't like adding retired to military men, because once a general, always a general. You're welcome. Also joining me on stage this afternoon is Basi Ephraim. Put your hands together for Basi Ephraim. Basi is a young, a young person like me, and Basi will also be introducing himself when he sits down. That, that applause was not interesting enough. Please make him welcome, encourage him. Thank you very much. Okay, the last but not the least uh, is a man who sat here all morning. He came here before most of us, and he's quite been very patient since he was here in the morning. He's uh, Cardinal John on Nikon. He will be joining us in just a jiffy. He will join us in just a jiffy. So, um, I would like the gentlemen who are here already to just tell the people who you are, and uh, in the same breath, also what your concept of leadership is thank you uh good afternoon everybody my name is uh, major general chris is uh, retired um i'm the immediate past uh, high commissioner of nigeria to india um to go to be given that appointment i was a member of apc uh, but when i came back and saw what apc is doing I resigned from APC and joined the Labour Party. And uh, when I resigned, I sent my letter of resignation to a copy to Mr. Peter B, His Excellency, and I was amazed. Within uh, 20 minutes, he responded and uh, uh, acknowledged and thanked me for joining him. So I am amongst uh, the millions of Nigerians that are hoping and praying that uh, he will become the president. Uh, because uh, when I speak on the subject, I will, I will, I will hold that the presidency uh, has a larger than has a very, very big job to do in uh, uh, bringing ethical leadership and, uh, they, you know, making it spread to other factors of our national life. I was trained at uh, the Nigerian Defense Academy and the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, and um, I retired as uh, the Chief of Policy and Plans at Army Headquarters. That was in 2006, 16 years ago. 
uh, that I retired. Um, but uh, as uh, the bishop said, uh, Bishop Honor, who incidentally is from the next village uh, to mine, uh, I've, I've tried to keep my, my body uh, functional and also to keep my brain alive by reading as much as I can. Uh, this is the former chairman of my local government. Um, I was his camp commandant in uh, 1987. See how time flies. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, so Mr. Vasi. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ephraim Basi Emma, and I work for an organization called the United States Institute of Peace, USIP, and I co-lead one of our peace building programs in Northeast Nigeria. Um, I am also um, a peace building scholar practitioner, so I write pieces, um, literature on peace building. I also publish um, on the topic, but I do so from um, a lens that I call um, a combination of theory and practice. So I am uh, a development worker, I'm a humanitarian, I'm also one who considers himself to be a systems thinker. And uh, yes, I'm a Cox scholar with the University of Notre Dame in the US um, when I first met Noel. And uh, so I'm happy to be here. So just to delve into the question, Okay, just, just hold on a bit. Um, um, His Eminence has just got back, so um, let's reintroduce and welcome on stage His Eminence, John Cardinal on Icon. Put your hands together. Put your hands together for him. <laughs> Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so um, I, don't, I don't think His Eminence needs any introduction, does he? <laughs> does he need a form of introduction? You want him to tell you a bit about himself? Okay, so I'll let His Eminence do that right away. Thank you very much, Vaughn. I thought Vaughn, I thought Vaughn means voice of Nigeria. <laughs> I'm on Ayeko. Thank you. I'm an Ayeko John, I'm the Cardinal. I have been Archbishop of Abuja for about 30 years now. Uh, now, no, no more indirect charge of the Archdiocese, but I'm still quite busy for, the, for the, whatever energy I have. I continue to spend it for the same things until the end comes. I am a retired Archbishop of Abuja. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Okay, so um, our plenary session is on ethical leadership, conflict prevention, and peace building. We have uh, 45 minutes to do that. I guess we've spent five minutes out of the 45. So let, let's look at the concept of leadership first and foremost. I, I would like to start with uh, a retired general. As a, you know, you're a military man. You've been in charge or, uh, at the military high command as well. You've also represented Nigeria internationally. That's massive uh, leadership on your shoulder there. You know, so what's your concept of leadership before we delve into ethical leadership? Well, the concept of leadership as uh, uh, conventionally we understand it and also as defined in the dictionary is um, uh, the, the responsibility, the position you find it yourself in managing whatever, whatever you lead, uh, and um, uh, and that involves getting the group to setting the goals uh, of uh, for the organisation, and then getting the group to work together uh, to meet those goals. That is um, the way I would define leadership in a very short uh, manner. Now, uh, so that I don't have to go back to ethical leadership, uh, and other people can talk about it when they come, you define the characteristics, the qualities that an ethical leader should have. Trust, both which will make him to, uh, um, to, to work with those 
uh, who are assigned to uh, uh, to relate with those who are assigned to work with him uh, based on their own competence rather than on other parameters like uh, considerations like for instance uh, the, tri the, the tribe they come from or the exclusive group that they come from you know uh, and trust also means uh, that the group that he's leading has to have trust in him um, I think it has been variously said by many people, including Mr. B himself, that the trust deficit is at the root of the problem that we have in Nigeria. I think Mr. Frank Weke also uh, alluded to that. You know, and uh, then you have, you have to have honesty. Corruption is a very big problem in Nigeria. If you are not an honest person and you come and you say that you want to fight corruption, um, people, when you are pointing one finger, four fingers will be pointing back at you and nobody will believe you. Now, they all, he also talked about fairness. We, all the problems, many of the problems that we have in Nigeria are, arise because some people feel that they are not included. That there is a, the, the, the feeling, of, feeling of inclusiveness is lacking in our place, whether it is tribal or whether it is a ethnic or whether it's uh, gender based, you know, so if you are a fair-minded leader, you will give everybody what is due to him in that quality. Now, the other one is uh, charisma, or rather, before I talk about charisma, let me talk about a uh, consideration, you know, consideration and fairness are closely related, you know, so consideration will say that you value the uh, interests of the collective more than your own personal interests. Many of the things that we are facing in Nigeria arise from selfishness at elite levels. You know, so if you, if you value consideration, then you will know that what is good for the goods is good for the Ganda, like they say, and that everybody has an equal stake in the endowments uh, of the country that you are managing. Then you have charisma. I don't know how many of you uh, bother to read the, uh, the history of the Second World War, but if you do, you will see uh, that uh, Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of uh, uh, the United Kingdom at the start of the war, um, that uh, uh, when Germany overran France in 1940, um, the morale in the UK was very low. So it was when Churchill came in that, because of his charismatic leadership, the English now uh, did what they thought was impossible. And then the rest is history. And so you need a charismatic leader. And uh, uh, to chari charisma involves many things. It involves in inspiring people. When the name of uh, um, Peter B was mentioned, there was enthusiastic reception, right? Uh -huh. Even those who have not seen him in the flesh, who have the opportunity to see him today, are inspired by him. Many from what they read about him in the cyberspace or on social media. Not to talk of when you now interact personally with him. It also means communication. You should be able to, no matter how good the, um, the noble, the intentions that you have are, you must communicate them to a people. And that is why those who do not have the power of, you don't have to be an orator to be a good communicator. What you have to do is that whatever you are saying, you must understand it first, you know, so that you don't just come and be parroting um, uh, maxims to people, or uh, you are going to do this and you are going to do that. And uh, if you are asked uh, to, uh, to define what you are to explain what you are to do. Once you re remove your, your eyes from the script that has been prepared for you, then you can no longer communicate. Okay. I think I, I think we this young lady that uh, uh, made a presentation to us. I have not seen anybody that communicates as much as she did, and uh, uh, and in the political uh, sphere, you all had uh, Frank Wiki. That is, and everybody. Everybody sees that it will be 
he, he doesn't speak with scripts you know so and he's going to speak to us today okay now another thing is in nigeria even outside of that charisma you must have um political will because to repair this country you have to have to step on so many toes if you do not have a political will you are not going to succeed if as we pray uh, peter b wins the election we know what happens in nigeria a president takes his uh, uh, budget to the national assembly you know and then we are told that uh, you need to, that the president's uh, liaison to the national assembly have to see the legislators in the night with uh, uh, packages and all that that's what we have been we have been told so if he comes and he's somebody he told us you know when he was in Anambra state how he uh, how he uh, fought against that but if he goes in now with the Labour Party and uh, and and the uh, rules Nigeria that have so many different tribes and so many different ways of looking at life um, I hope and pray that when he begins to discipline them that they are going to understand that is for the good of Nigeria rather than uh, that the good of Nigeria is more important than, than okay. that. So if he doesn't, if he has political will which he has uh, uh, displayed, it is going to uh, help him. Okay. You know, okay. So thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. You, you, okay, let me use this one. So, um, Mr. Abbasi Ephraim, um, I wouldn't let you define leadership because I think General Eze have done you know, a deep justice to that as well. So, in Nigeria, um, what have we seen as regards to leadership and ethical leadership? Okay, so I'm going to take this question from the perspective of being a young person. Okay. And trying to create much more context in terms of trying to look at what the future looks like. If we are talking about ethical leadership, you are asking or you are saying it's important that we have leadership that is people focused or people centered. You are asking that we are saying leadership should focus on solving real life problems. You are saying leadership should be participatory. You are saying leadership should be inclusive. You are saying leadership should be systemic. Now, saying all of these things, it's important that as young people, and um, I like that the first um, um, panel really laid the foundation in terms of trying to help us understand how education shapes leadership and how it helps shape society. If we have to change the trajectory of the country, it's important that we all get engaged. Engagement in itself as young people is a form of leadership. You cannot change something that you don't understand how it works. You cannot change something that you do not even recognize exists. So if we are saying we want to build, focus on building a country that works for every one of us, then it's important that we recognize ourselves as agents of change and are part of that process of change. Saying that, I also want to highlight the importance of even recognizing the power in our agency. So, um, he highlight, um, the, the colonel highlighted something on charisma, on having a persona that is very persuasive. If you're a leader and you do not even understand that you have the power and the will to transform society, then it is not easy for us to fall in line as followers. So, as young people, it's important that we change our mindsets. There is need for reorientation. I'm gone at the days when we say it's not our business. And one time I got engaged in a conversation with someone very recently. And he says, oh, you like talking about peace, 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 peace. And he says, it's not my business. I said, you think it's not your business because it's not in your doorstep yet. But do you realize now that the, the discussion around security has changed? What do we say now? Security is what? Everybody's what? is everybody's responsibility in the past i always ask was it everybody's responsibility no it was because some people thought it was left for a particular set of people now we need not to be in that category where we say it is not our concern if we must change society if leadership is ethical it must recognize that it needs to carry everybody along 
and that includes laying the platform that enables everybody to be part of influencing change and i'm saying this not because we're getting only because we're getting into an election season i'm saying this because when we talk about the future leaders of tomorrow and they say the youth are i mean we are the leaders of today and we are the leaders of tomorrow the future is you the future is me i am the future you are the future so it is important that we are not making the same mistakes or we are not throwing the same paths that has led us to where we are as a country now it's important that as young people we are focusing trying to be innovative the world is getting dynamic and part of the idea of being an ethical leader is your dynamism how are you adapting to change how are you ensuring that you are working as a leader of an organization as a teacher as a student how are you trying to make sure that you are engaged in transforming and adjusting or adapting your institution or the organization that you manage to the current realities that shape the world so that is where i would leave it at now and when we get into um hopefully we we'll get deeper into the conversation okay i, I think um I, I took away something quite very important for leadership to work we all have to get involved Absolutely. in the process because you cannot Absolutely. change what you do not Absolutely. understand that's very um, lovely your eminence yes. um apparently we 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 somehow theoretically know everything about leadership you know um we've seen people contest elections and they come up with beautiful policies and plans for the country that never gets translated into actions you know that um, touch people's lives directly and you see a lot of scholars has found a lot of um, knowledge on what, what what we need to do to change our country what seems to be the problem with leadership in Nigeria thank you very much uh, first let me congratulate the uh, boys champions for being able to put together this kind of uh, occasion, bringing this kind of large you know, number of young people together. It is important. And uh, uh, if this happens in many places, it will create a critical mass of young people who are really sincerely interested in uh, not just letting things remain the way they are so congratulations to you noel and all your uh, your friends one of the panelists uh, helped me out of a problem i had in mid from, from the world go when i got your letter these boys champions i was asking myself where are the girls but <laughs> that we needed girls champions too but he has explained to me that the focus is on let the get the men be real men and a real man doesn't maltreat a woman when a, when a husband begins to beat his wife what has he proved that he's stronger that's not the place to do that if you want to prove how strong you are then engage another man then we know you are strong so if it is right, if you can get the boys well trained to respect themselves and respect their daughters, their sisters, just like they, I hope, love and respect their mothers, a lot of these gender issues will take a different shape. Um, Mr. Vaughan, I'm not sure whether I will eventually answer your question, but the, let us talk around the issue of leadership. Uh, There are all kinds of leadership, you know. Even among a gang of robbers, there is a leader, isn't there? And the, guy, the bandits up in the northeast, they have their leaders, in fact, who are now even well known. So well known that uh, even the government can't do anything to them, much to our embarrassment and surprise. So the question is not so much leadership, but leadership for what? And the, the direction of leadership will depend on the concept of leadership with which you operate. We have been having leaders in Nigeria now. They have been leading. But we now know they have not been leading us in the right direction. And so we, the question to be asked now, why is it that leadership has been emerging and somehow we, have not, we are not 
in getting the right results. And uh, here, before I even go to that, uh, the youth, um, Bishop uh, Professor Orna said, what actually made him uh, uh, suspend his pastoral visit to come here is because of the aspect of meeting the youth. So the same reason which made me accept your friend's uh, um, invitation, Father Emmanuel Ojefo, to come to this occasion because I'm going to meet young people. Again, the concept of youth, especially in terms of politics in Nigeria, it seems that we we are not taking it. We are almost in many areas quite amnest. We have an amnesia, forgetfulness. It is my feeling that the first major politicians we had in Nigeria, those people now whom we now look and think that they were ancestors, Azikiwe, Awolowo, Amadu Bello, from my own reading of the history, they were all young people. They were all young people, straight from university. They happened to, be, to have trained most of them abroad. So they were young people. And if you fast forward, the events of 1966, which has made a, a major impact on the life of our country for 30 full years of military rule. Who were those who led that whole movement? Ojuku was in his early 30s. Gowon was not married. He was 31 years old. And the boys around them who did the thing were many of them were in their late 20s. My governor in the then the North Central State, it was called, Bami Boye was only 28 years old. This was the, the young people who took action. Did they take the right action or the wrong action? I think we, are, we should be able to fall back now and read the history and at least learn how youth should not be, how youth action should not be. But it will at least tell us that the youth can move things. Don't wait till you are 50 or even till you are 40. It might be getting late. I was a bishop already at 38. And I didn't see myself as a small boy. One text of, of St. Paul that I always loved was, let nobody look down on you because you are young. Paul was telling Timothy, who was a young boy, well, I am now 78, and I am not foolish to think I'm still a small boy. I'm an old man now. But when, what it means with me is that when I see my young reverend father, who is 25, 30, I don't look on him as a small boy anymore. I know when I was your age, this is where I was. I had a sense of, of, of a dignity, leadership. People were calling me father. My own father was calling me father. <laughs> oh, yes. And we took it seriously that people are calling me father. That means I'm expected to be their father, even though I have a number of years are not so much. So there is something there about leadership which comes with God's own. It's God who determines and gives it. Don't think that we should not think that this whole thing works only in terms of religion. There's such a thing as leadership quality, uh, gifts of leadership. The students, God bless all of you. We all remember when we were in secondary school. Our former minister, Mweke Junior, I was, I'm still to meet Mweke Senior. <laughs> but he told us he left school in 82. You left secondary school in 82 in Maduguri. Uh -huh. I left St. Michael's Secondary School, Ali Ede, not too far from here, Benway State, Benway State yeah. in 1962. Oh. <laughs> 
Um, in the school, we already had leadership. The Reverend Father, we were in, in the Catholic school. School goes fathers around the schools. Already from one, you have a prefect in the class. And he was expected to lead. We learned how to lead our lead our peers. Okay. We learned how to lead our peers. At the end of the year, 1962, final year, we had the head boy who spoke and whom we respected, but who also took his responsibility seriously. Okay, I I'm sorry, Your Eminence. Uh, so probably you are alluding to the fact that maybe the problem with uh, getting quality and effective leadership in Nigeria is the fact that let all, me, of, let, all of us okay. feel... Let me let's summarize. Okay. <laughs> let me summarize. But I want to also broaden this question. Yeah. But if we are talking about political leadership yeah. of Nigeria, then let's know that we are talking of a specific level of leadership. And that specific level of leadership requires, they have mentioned already, it requires honesty, it requires focus. From a religious point of view, and I'm doing maybe the more religious among the two of us, <laughs> yeah, it is clearly religiously based that um, a, a leader of human beings must know that he is leading for God in God's name because only God has a right to control and command human beings. No human being has a right to control other human beings because each human being is made in the image and likeness of God and has God given dignity freedom. When we gather together for the purposes of getting this working, we do end up having somebody to lead us but when we acknowledge somebody to lead us we have not abdicated our dignity and our freedom to him to do whatever he likes with us and one of the problems with leadership in Nigeria is the moment we vote them in we, we relax and say let them do whatever they like as if we have already abdicated our dignity to them so that is where the religious angle comes in it was very clear in our traditional religion and today, the lack of it and the fact that leaders are operating in a way that they, they, they claim immunity and they try and do whatever they like and they insist on really whether they are doing well or not is because we have not accepted the, the spiritual base of human leadership. Add on to that what Jesus himself added. Remember the story when Jesus was telling his apostles among the pagans they are, they are rulers lord it over them among you it must not be so because the leader among you must be the servant of all how do you apply that to Nigeria are the rulers in Nigeria operating like those whom Jesus described as the pagans who lord it over their subjects well, we don't have all Christian leaders in Nigeria, though. And this has nothing to do so that we can be powerful and with political power, you can make money, you can do whatever you like. Of course, we'll continue to roll around where we are. Okay, thank you very much, Your Eminence. Um, um, thank you. General Leze, um, I, I picked a lot of things from what he said, you know, um, part of which is the fact that you cannot a leader cannot lead in isolation there has to be followers and if followers are not following well then that means the leader is not either leading well you know or there's a problem somewhere so where do we all as citizens of nigeria come in in the uh, you know picture of getting right ethical leadership to avoid you know conflicts that will divide us like we're seeing today well i think that uh the people who design the democracy, uh, starting from Benjamin Franklin or going back, you know, to the Magna Carta and all that, I think the the new they took a cognizance of uh, the biblical saying that the the heart of man is evil, and then because of that they designed the checks and balances. 
Our problem, uh, just like His Eminence says, is that we abdicate our responsibility uh, in the public political space. And by the way, um, we are stressing uh, leadership at the political level because we know the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Our institutions are weak, and anybody that you ask, including Frank Weke here, he says that our problem is leadership. And he was talking about our problem, is, uh, and when he finishes talking about our problem is leadership, he says, when I become governor, this is what I'm going to do. Because the governor and the president have executive powers, right? Yes. Okay. And the Nigerian constitution has given such powers to the president that even if you have ethical leadership in other fields of endeavor, there's virtually little that you can do except if you now have an ethical leader there, which I will argue uh, we have not had since at least um, the death of Motala. Let me put it that way. Um, I think that uh, when uh, Yaradua came, we had some glimpse of it. So I will boldly say that uh, we have had false dawns, you know, uh, promises of uh, good leadership, and then I don't know whether, whether they were overwhelmed by our institutions or whether they themselves deliberately sabotage the institutions uh, where we are now. Uh, one can plausibly argue that we have very little ethical leadership. And that's why I am talking, I started with, I mentioned uh, uh, Peter not because he is coming here, but because he has a past which everybody can scrutinize, and then we can extrapolate from that past to the future. Now, back to your question, what do we uh, what can we all contribute to changing the situation? That's yeah, your question. Yes, yeah. Well, the first one is uh, what is already happening, potentially happening, uh, which is to say that somebody who is, somebody has come on to uh, unleash a dynamic where for the first time in Nigeria we are entertaining the possibility of uh, a man winning the presidential election without uh, giving shishi. Not be so then the talker. Eh? Uh -huh, good. So, so the first thing that we need to do is, uh, is uh, to demonetize our politics. If we do not demonetize our politics, we are not going to get anywhere. And that demonetization of the politics is going to start with this experiment. Because if this experiment fails, God forbid, the lesson that everybody is going to learn from me is that uh, is a, is a quixotic uh, approach to, uh, to politics. I, I don't know how many of us have read uh, Don Quixote by Cervantes here, but uh, Quixote uh, wrote the, the, the book of people charging at windmills. You know? So this is actually an existential election for us. So, and the youth is here. It is the youth that is going to be at the vanguard of this endeavor by um, uh, by evangelizing others, by showing, uh, by example, you know, that they reject uh, that monetization, they reject thuggery, they reject everything, and then bringing pressure to bear on the other institutions, you know, which have complementary roles to play in the election, like the security services and the INEC. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. So one is uh, encouraged, uh, look at the currency change, for instance. It is said that the currency change is uh, aimed at uh, reducing the, the uh, probability of uh, uh, vote buying. That's, that, I think that is what uh, Mr. President himself said. Okay? And uh, also look at the bimodal uh, bi voter accreditation system, the BVAS. So all of us are here, you know, and uh, if you, it is still the youth and the, all the people at all segments of society uh, that, are, that are taken by buses to, to certain uh, uh, campaign uh, rallies because they are paid to go and give the appearance of uh, legitimacy to people whom they know should, should not be there at all. You understand? So we start 
from this election. If we get this election right, it, we are going to set a precedent that uh, if you do not do well in government, you will be voted out. You know? So, and uh, Mr. Nweke was a minister, and uh, he was, uh, he was uh, in government at uh, Enugu State, and I'm sure that he knows that that paradigm shift that I'm talking about now was not there. This is the time that we're about to start. Have you know this, Oga? Thank you. So the, the job is starts with the youth. They did that in Zambia. They did that in Tanzania. They did that in Malawi. They did that in Lesotho. All right? So if the president comes, so what people can do? Okay. So let me, start, let, let, let me start with the president. If he, if he leads well, then he is going to uh, be the role model and other people down the line will copy him. Then, or will take a dressing from him, as we say in the yeah, army. Then, uh, uh, leaders in other aspects of our national life, be they public or private, religious, professional bodies, whatever, students, organizations, and all that, you know, I think they will follow suit and then inculcate ethical leaderships at their own level, and then the result will be the rebuilding of the institutions which are this, which is the state personified. And then we'll have a better society. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Please pass it to me, Mr. Bassi. So um, young, young persons are the forefront of the change that we seek. You are a young person. Do you think the young people of today are ready for that change? I would like you to answer that in just uh, 60 seconds so we can get to the audience for a few questions and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. You asked me the question I'm going to ask the audience. Okay. Young people, do we think we are ready to take our society back? Yes. Please go out and vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So I don't know if there are people who have questions in the audience um, about taking our country back, having ethical leadership to prevent uh, you know, conflicts and build peace in our communities. I would really like if there are those in the gallery who have questions. Could you come down? The mic may not be able to get there. Very quickly, just one or two persons. Just one or two persons, very quickly. And then we'll give them a sense of belonging because they've been part of this audience, but somehow they've not been able to participate uh, directly. So someone is coming down. Someone is coming down. Yes. They'll hand the mic over to you quickly so you ask your questions as briefly as possible. Thank you, the panelists. Um, my question will be broad based as I may have to direct the question to a politician in the sense of the word as being a politician, Frank Nwike Jr. He's not in the panelist, that's why I said he will be broad based. Um, while we stepped out to take a photograph at the, um, the Green Pub outside, the Shaping the Future conference um, banner that was put out was falling. And then I made a very simple joke. I said the future we are trying to shape is already falling. Now, that implies that at this point, I do not, I do not think that those above the age of 56 do have, in quotes, the moral rectitude to advise the young generation when it connects politics at this point in time. The case is, they have failed us and woefully. They had all the opportunity to transform this country and they did not. I will be asking Frank specifically and then direct the next question on leadership to His Eminence, His Excellence, please. Please, Frank, as a prospective governor of Enugu State, in your ideology, what do you think is the most basic issue concerning political structure in Nigeria? At every turn in time, when politicians make campaigns, they make these campaigns on ethical basis on ethnic and tribalistic tensions that fires up the youths. We seem to like that. This person is from my side. What is the church doing? I know the church will say that they have put up a lot of written arguments. They have advised the people. They have released communiques. They have advised us to pray for 
peaceful, fair, transparent elections, this is not enough, in my opinion. Okay, the so church, I, the church guess, transparently I, has the largest body of followers. The church can mandate. When I use the word mandate, I mean the church can say, this person is credible. Vote for him. In Latvia, this experiment is practical. 76% of the people living in Latvia are Catholics. And they control the voting system. Not okay. that the church imposes on them who to vote. So I'm asking his eminence, here in Nigeria, is that practicable? Why hasn't the church done is that? that practicable? Okay. So, um, Mr. Frank will answer your question very quickly, and then his eminence will also respond. Okay. The second question, please give him. Thank you very much. I, uh, I would have loved to ask this if His Excellency Peter you was here, but I can as well throw it open now, since I don't know if you have another opportunity for questions. So, everyone has been talking about the need to participate in politics. And then, you know, try to elect good leaders. Leadership has been the song here since we came. So, last, sometime last week, our last two weeks, His Excellency Peter B was asked a question. He was asked, how do we deal with the issue of the commission that is responsible for helping us elect a leader? I mean, I neck now. And he gave a response that he's a player in the field that he doesn't like to talk about referees. So, personally, that was the first time I disagreed with any P2B answer. So, and I'm asking, if you're a player and you don't want to talk about the referees, have you forgotten that the referees have the final say? Because you can score a goal and the referee will decide and say it's not a goal. So, if you transmit it to our elections here, what can we do practically? Because it's a challenge. For me, I think I neck is the greatest challenge we have in this election. What can we do practically to address this issue of our electoral system not interfering with the choice of the people. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Okay, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry. Why do we have time enough for a lot of questions? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But you, you could continue to engage with us on socials. There are people who respond to you on our social media platforms. That's the last, they said last one. Okay, my question goes like this. Like just somebody said something yesterday when I was in a vehicle, he said uh, that the governor said any good state is in the hand of God, but now it's no longer true that any good state is in the hand of Fulanese. Why do I say such? Can we like move forward in a society whereby there's no unity? For example, now we're talking about education as a lead to every society. Now the people in head don't value education. Let me not mention any, but let me, but let me use it metaphorically. That the, the leader of a country who doesn't value education, and how can people on that have the access there? Is it not when there is a demarcation? Like some are against education, why some value it? But reverse was the case that those that don't value it is now on top. Now, not giving us access for those that value it to come on top, then how can that success be achieved? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's the last question. Um, Ms. Wakweke, you have the floor. Let's quickly pass the mic to him so that he can answer the question. Yes, uh, briefly. Um, I just hope understood the question that the gentleman asked. Can you help me what, rephrase it? The biggest problem with politics in Nigeria, the way we practice uh, politics. First of all, thank you so much uh, to the panelists for the excellent insights that you have uh, provided. If I may just preface my, um, my response, just a brief comment on the matter of leadership. And I want to say that leadership of any kind, at any level, whether it's in a family, any leadership, no matter the sector, no matter the industry, if that leadership does not in some way catalyze some form of improvement in the human condition, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a home, whether it's in the military, whether it's in, at, in, at the societal level at large, there is no basis whatsoever for such uh, a position or such an individual to be called a leader. And I say this because there is always the problem of uh, mistaking a position of authority as a position of leadership. 
the fact that you're in a position of authority does not make you a leader what makes you a leader is what you do with that position i just thought i might uh, make that uh, uh, contribution now i'm afraid i'm not going to sound very different from the very eminent panel that we have the problem with nigeria is simply and squarely the failure of political leadership i reiterated earlier that it is the quality of your political leadership that determines the outcome in your private sector it is the quality of your political leadership the people that make the policies that is that uh, design the programs they are the ones that determine the exchange rate of your naira it is the quality of political leadership that determines the integrity of your electoral outcomes whether elections are free and fair whether it is participatory whether it is inclusive whether whatever you want to call it it depends on the quality of political leadership i found it very interesting a few days ago some reportage that was attributed to the national chairman of the all progressive grand alliance uh, of um, uh, national chairman of the apc uh alaji uh, adamu abdullahi where he was saying that well he's come from somewhere and that they know that there's no um there's no uh, network service and therefore that this beavers thing they don't want it this electronic transmission thing they don't want it and stuff like that you want to take us back to egypt we're not going anywhere we are not going back to egypt and what is about to happen will be the first time in our electoral history where credible elections will take place okay. the outcome is in your hands okay. it's in the hands of the people here okay. and let me just say one last thing one last thing please and so the gentleman who said oh what is the church doing what is the church doing what is this person doing what are you doing if you decide if you decide if you decide to sell your votes is the cardinal going to follow you into a boot a boot is the bishop going to follow you into a boot will the will anybody follow you to where you're going to go and vote when you go to market to go and sell something you take a good or something that you want to sell some merchandise you want to sell when you take it to the market and you say you want to sell this and i come and buy it from you when I have bought it from you, the thing I bought from you, won't I go home with it? When you sell your votes to the politician for one packet of Indomie or for 500 Naira or for 1,000 Naira, the man has carried the vote and he has taken off. Because you sold it. Asha and then Rashi. Once you've done that, that's the end of it. So you okay. have yourself to blame. Okay. There's only so much the church can do. There's only so much I can do. I have done what I can do. I'm submitting myself to scrutiny. I'm submitting myself to vetting. I'm submitting myself to questioning. If you find me credible, vote for me. Thank you. If sir. you don't find me credible, vote for Thank someone you, else. Sir. Thank That's you. what we can do. But you must do your part, which is to vote. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very beautiful contribution. Your Eminence, um, can the church really influence, you know, uh, how people vote, the voting patterns of the public, and the church influence that. Should the church influence that, actually? Well, first you must uh, define what do you mean by church under those circumstances. <laughs> if by church you are talking about the Catholic Bishops' Conference, we have our specific role. But if you ask me what is the church, then the Catholic Bishops' Conference is not the church. The church in Niger and the church, we are talking of Catholic church, in Nigeria are all the members of the church including any of you here who are catholics you are the church but when the, this church is so big with different membership and we have a division of labor within that church that is why in the area of giving directives spiritual guidance and prayer the clergy takes responsibility to reach out to the people but when it comes to going into the uh, battle political battle we expect people like Eze and others like him who are also i don't know i am presuming you are a catholic uh -huh. we expect them to be church there in those arena so don't ask them um, i'm glad the person who asked the question actually listed out what the church has done that is and what the church can do and we are trying our best to do it i think i'm in a position to say clearly that 
the bad government we have had in this country, we have consistently opposed them that they are doing the wrong thing. If they had listened to us, we will not be where we are today. Give me any communique we wrote that says the rubbish and the corruption that is happening is the right thing to do. We have always pointed out where politicians, political leadership have got it wrong and we have kept asking them to do the right thing. Okay. To the extent that the Catholic Bishops Conference was seen by many regimes as always, we are always considered as if we are the opposition. Of course, for as long as the thing is not doing well, we oppose it. Now, the final question, uh, I imagine that answered the question that the church should give mandate to somebody. I don't know what you have in mind. Maybe you think that the church should now say, since Obi is a good Catholic, we all should now tell every Catholic, go and vote Obi. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you will not hear that from us. Not in Nigeria. And you cannot quote other countries in this regard. You can't quote Poland. In Poland, Poland was all Catholic. You can't quote Philippines. Philippines was all Catholic. Cardinal Sin in the Philippines was an institution. It's a, when it comes to a, a who to how to, when it comes to political strategy for the winning of power, the rules of politics must be allowed to go to have its, its play. Okay. In fact, it would be counterproductive if we were to come out publicly to 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 to, uh, to, to endorse one particular candidate. Because if, even if all Catholics voted for that person, that doesn't give him the victory. Don't forget there are many Christians who are not Catholics. Okay, okay, and, thank you. And the, uh, the issue is, we should go back. Every politician should go onto the field. The important thing is insisting on, let there be a level, level playing field during the campaigns. Let the elections be done without violence and okay. fully, and let the results be correctly announced. Thank you very yeah, we much. Shall be happy. Thank you very much. Please, uh, a round of applause for His Eminence, John Cardinal Onaikon. Thank you very much for being a part of this uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Bas Ivrim, thank you very much for being part of this panel. And of course, uh, retired General Chris Eze, thank you very much for being part of this panel. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much. You guys were amazing. Thank you. They will take a picture. But they should deserve a round of applause from the young people who are here, especially. Please take a picture. Yeah, Somebody is coming to do that. The general should smile. Soldiers don't smile, but I, I permit you to do so now. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Vaughan Maduko for an excellent job. Thank you so much indeed for moderating. Basi Ephraim, we're grateful to you. The retired general, I salute you. The Cardinal, may God bless you. Thank you, my lord. Thank you. Boys champions, thank you so much. I have been an MC on several occasions, but not once have I seen this great patience shown by young people who are not uh, disturbed by the length of time they have spent here. It must not be taken for granted. We want to thank you so much. Peter Obi, Mr. Peter Obi has shown his humility once again by asking for your forgiveness that he will still be here, that he was delayed in Calabar for coming here. That's what we are getting. That was why he has spent this time. But in the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, he will be here. He still assures that. So thank you so much. We are going to go into, uh, we'll take, thank you. We are going to use a particular program to wait for him. Otherwise, it is his time now. We are going to, eh, Emiloko? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. That's the only Yoruba word I understand these days. Okay, we, our words will be presented to some noble persons who have uh, been instrumental to the success of Boys Champions. May I now call on the founder, Boys Champions, 
Mr. Noel Ifani Alamona to come forward for this moderation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Aka. Um, over time, we have continued to enjoy the support of different people, different organizations. We have our different partners from the United States, UK, and a whole lot of other places. And we can be thankful to them enough. We're very grateful to them. We have also decided on this day to recognize people who are making great impacts in the society. So we have different categories of award, and one of those awards is under, you know, the Boys Champions Peace Award. And I am happy to announce to you that there is no other person whom we deemed fit for this award other than one man who has inspired many through his organization. He has an organization like myself, and what he does with that organization is to develop peace builders across Nigeria, across Africa. And I'm talking about no other person but His Eminence, Cardinal John Onaikon. So please, may I have the honor to call on him to come forward to, um, on the stage. And I also wish to take this moment to invite my former local government chairman, who is Ebly Repres who is here, um, this is one of the persons who has inspired me over time, and his humility is second to none. It may interest you to know that I never invited him, but he made it to this event. So you can imagine that. So thank you very much, Dr. Godwin Aboy, for being here, for coming here to support us. And I also want to invite my beautiful wife to be, to actually come here and stand here on the stage with us while we offer the award. Dr. Chini, please. Please put your hands together for her. Yeah? Okay, please. The team. Your eminence, this side. So, the Canada does not need any introduction. In case you are wondering what organization he owns, that's Cardinal Onaikon Foundation for Peace well-known all over and across Africa and across the world. And what Cardinal has done over time, you know, building peace, interreligious dialogue, and what have you around peace building has been enormous. And we cannot but appreciate him enough using this award. Um, okay. Boys Champions Peace Award presented to Cardinal John Onaikon by Boys Champions Foundation on, of the 2022 Shaping the Future Conference, holding here in Enugu. Congratulations, Your Eminence. It was only when we were sitting here that I heard that this thing is going to happen. And I want to thank you and those who work with you for um, giving this honor to uh, me because of the work of my foundation. And the work is going on. And, the, and there are young people largely involved in it. So uh, since this is a, 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 an audience of young people who are IT savvy, if you want to know about my foundation, just go online. We have a very active website, either COFP Cof Foundation or Fully Cardinal Onayeko Foundation for Peace. The whole idea is to face to tackle the middle level of interreligious dialogue, because I was convinced that on the top, people see Onayeko and, Kad and the Sultan moving around, and they say, "Oh, the elders, the leaders have agreed." In the bottom. In the market, we say market, Christians and Muslims are doing their business together without any quarrel. It is in the middle that the problem is, especially the middle level religious leaders, pastors and imams. And we are targeting that level so that uh, we can live in peace 
under one God. And uh, that will bring us the prosperity that God himself has ready for us. Thank you very much, Noel. Thank you very much, Baba, for, help, for giving me this. And may God bless your effort and uh, the, uh, the um, intentions of the boys champion. And the, the, the girls should not, now you know that the girls should not be angry that they are not mentioned. They are boys champion. They are also championing the cause of the girls, aren't you? <laughs> God bless you. Please put your hands together once again for the Cardinal. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. So one of my friends who is also going to come on board very soon as a director or a board member of Boys Champions has decided to establish um, an award in his name in Africa. and. He is an Australian who is also a British citizen. And after thinking about um, how to go about this, he decided to do this through our organization. Um, I am talking about no other person but Dr. Helmut Schuster. His video is going to be played shortly before I go on so he can understand the framework behind his award. But that award, according to him, he wants to be recognizing every year a young person in Nigeria who is making change happen in the community. And Boys Champions will continue to give this award in his name. He was supposed to be here. He has already gotten his visa. He had taken all the necessary vaccinations and all that to be in Nigeria. But a couple of days ago, his organization insisted that he cannot travel because of the security situation. Well... It happened, and that's it. So, and he has decided to commit $10,000 every year to support a, a big idea, a young person who is making incredible changes in their community. So, this is the first time, and it's going to happen again next year, and even as time goes on. So, let us listen to him, and then after that, um, we'll announce the winner. After all the processes and the nominees that we had, we decided to select one. So, please, the video for Dr. Hello everyone, um, hello from Liechtenstein. I'm here with my friend Daniel, um, who helps me recording this video message, uh, which was not planned. It was planned for me to be with you, uh, uh, to be there in person. I'm really disappointed that I can't be in, in, in Ugo. Um, I've never been on share and was so much looking forward to that. It was the trip of the year. Uh, I've got all my vaccinations, I've got all my documents ready. And unfortunately, sometimes things don't play out the way you wish them to play out. So I do apologize, but I'm certain I will be in Nigeria at one point in time. So brief introduction, my name is Helmut Schuster. Um, I'm an economist. Um, most of my career was an executive in a big oil company. Um, I'm now a producer. Um, I'm an economist. Um, most of my career was an executive in a big oil company. Um, I'm now uh, privileged enough to work for a health company. Um, uh, but my passion really is about uh, helping young entrepreneurs, founders, to find their way in society and in business. Uh, how did I meet Noel? I met Noel this summer in, in New York at uh, the AFS uh, Youth Assembly. Um, he was one of the 10 finalists for the very prestigious AFS award and... Uh, uh, the four judges, including myself, anonymously declared him the winner. Uh, boys champions, his foundation, um, I think, uh, could potentially be something far more significant than he and the team realize. It's about establishing gender equality and stop violence against women. Uh, so, Noel, well done. And when Noel invited me to this conference, I was really excited about coming uh, because I really, I really believe Nigeria is the future. I think what you guys do is amazing. 
And um, so we decided a few things and I asked him, how can I best help you? And we agreed to establish an award like uh, the FS award uh, might be a good idea. Um, so what is this award all about? Uh, and Noel is going to talk a bit more about that. It really is about uh, a number of things. Firstly, um, uh, award and reward and recognize great ideas, bold ideas, um, courage, uh, thinking outside the box. It's about integrity because integrity is so important um, for society. It's about contribution to society. Uh, but it's also about um, uh, dreams, big dreams, living bold dreams. And um, so I wish Noel much luck for that award. I think the team is going to work a bit further to exactly define the criteria. Um, now, the other thing, and this is very important, this conference, I think it's very, very important to uh, get young people together and give them the ability to share thoughts, dreams. Um, I'm going to leave you with a few advices, uh, tips. I'm a bit or much older than you all are. Um, I think experience is the most over, but also the most underrated thing. So first thing is actually stay connected with the people uh, you meet um, uh, today. Um, uh, share your phone numbers. I think it might be a very powerful foundation for the rest of your life. Uh, we all need a foundation with the rock and the members of this conference can be. The second thing is, uh, which I think is very important, is um, think back on your life, about your education. There are some things you might have learned in the first 20 years which are useful and others are not. And make choices. Make choices about uh, what you wish to unlearn because our education and our parents are also sometimes our biggest limitation in fulfilling our dreams and wishes. Um, I think it's very important that you dream big. Um, you live in a country that has a great future, so dream big. And, and the, the last thing I really want to leave you with, and this is from my own experience, you will face setbacks, failures, uh, but never stop. Yeah, Never stop. Never give up. Never give up. It's very, very important. Most ideas don't actually live on because people give up far too early. I see that in my startups. Those who are resilient, those who learn from their mistakes and failures are normally much more successful. So let me give you one big mantra for this conference. Never give up and succeed. Never give up and succeed. And I wish you all the best. Much luck. And Noel, thank you very much for having invited me. Thank you so much. Series of, you know, we first of all nominated different people for this award and then these people had to go through um, certain criteria check and after doing that with my team we have decided on one person who is doing an amazing work in her community my organization has also decided to give that person an opportunity to work with my organization so that is to begin with because she is making an incredible change in her community she's doing so well and especially around gender-based violence ending gender-based violence and that is very important to us um, and i would want to call on the general to please come um, up to the stage to present this award to this incredible young girl who is making great change happen in her community and i would want to use this opportunity to announce to you the first winner of the dr helmut schuster's award for young africans here in Enugu, presented by the boys champions as Winifred Mbanugu. So please come forward. So she's also volunteering with us on this day. And she's been an incredible person working as young as she is. She has done so well for herself. And I wish that a lot of other young leaders would actually um, em learn from her and emulate what she does. Please put your hands together for her. Thank you very much. Can you come to the middle? Helmut Schusa Leadership Award for Young Africans. Thank you very much for all you do in your community. Thank you for being so supportive. We appreciate you and we would love to work with you in our organization.
going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. you because uh, I've been asked to make the formal presentation. Um, I would uh, request that when we finish you can say one or two things about actually what she's doing. What she told us is that uh, it's making a lot of impact. So, but if you tell just like uh, the Cardinal told us, so that if anybody wants to um, learn more about it, uh, they can uh, have the link. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think you can talk for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm really super delighted and speechless at this point. I wasn't really expecting this. And I want to say a very big thank you to Hermes Kushka and our Boys Champions organization. My name is Winifred Chidera Mbanuko. I'm a young aspiring female leader that is committed to make a positive change in the society. Over the years, I've been volunteering with organizations, especially with the area of gender-based violence. Recently, I released a spoken word video on the topic of gender-based violence. And aside that as well, I've been committed to secondary schools, talking to students, because I mean, the students are the future leaders who we need to make this positive impact. So I've been committed to these organizations, volunteering, not even expecting anything out of it. And today, I'm really speechless, and I wasn't really expecting this award. I want to encourage every youth out there, no matter what you are doing, you might not really be encouraged at that point, but this award today has really encouraged me to keep on giving my best at every point of my life, knowing that one day an award for recognition would come. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Winifred. You know, one thing she said that is very important to me um, is the fact that you should continue doing what you do. For instance, I started my first organization, HOPE. I started HOPE 12 years ago. Nobody knows about HOPE as they know boys champions that I just began four years ago. That is it, right? And all the works that I had done with HOPE, there was no recognition, recognition as such. But immediately we started with boys champions, different recognitions and all that. So you never can tell, just keep doing what you do. I have founded different companies and organizations that failed from the beginning. You know, but look at where we are today. So just continue doing what you do. One day, just one day, something might come that would propel you to a higher level. So just as we plan to conclude and as we wait on His Excellency, you saw his tweet online, for those of you who are on Twitter, so that means he's going to be here very shortly. But there is a presentation that I know a lot of people have been expecting, and that presentation is from one young, one young man who is making an, an, an incredible impact using the skills that God has given to him. If you notice what we did with this event is that we featured young people. That is exactly the reason we started um, Shaping the Future Conference. We want to continue to spotlight the gifts that our young people in Nigeria have. If you think that I am smart, you've not met these incredible leaders that are seated right here. So it is on that note that I want to welcome the only best saxophonist that is in town in Nigeria at this moment. If King Sass is here, let him step up on the stage. I know a lot of you know King Sass from social media, but I brought him down to Enugu, just like I brought Hafsa. So King Sass, if you're here, this is your time. Oh, he's at the back and he's coming. So thank you very much for all of you who are working so hard to make this event successful. My staff, they have been so wonderful. About, we have, right now in Enugu, we just opened a new space in Enugu, and we have about 12 staff, that, staff members that are working for us in Enugu here. And I cannot but thank them for putting this thing together. They were the ones who made this happen. Our volunteers, you see them wearing the t-shirts and all, all over the whole place. I am grateful to all of you. Thank you very much for the amazing works and the 
energy that you put into making this event happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have like different openings in the organization for some of you who would want to work with us. In case you're very passionate about the work that we do, I love working with young people who are very passionate and driven. So if you're driven like our organization or you love what we do, this is the time. You can reach out to us, info at boyschampions.org uh -huh. to ask for the friend because we don't advertise some of those positions unless we're desperately in need. So we only want to work with young people who are really amazing, who are ready to drive change through Boys Champions. So thank you all very much, and I hope that, yeah. So I think I leave the stage for um, a performance by the only King Sass. <laughs> generations and to say we want to make it a better place for our children and our children's children so that they they they, they know it's a better world for them. Waiting for the second back. I just want to say the Niger Spirit Talent Hunt has been a blessing to me. I went on a competition as a saxophonist and I came out the best. I I did every of my craftsmanship on the stage and um, I never believed I was going to scale through on the competition, but 
God did it. So I'm very happy to be here. I've been a beneficiary on this very great conference. Like, um, I've learned a lot. I wish I had this opportunity when I was in school, but I'm a graduate. This is what I do for a living, and um, I'm going places, and I thank God so much. I, I've been blessed by this great talent of mine. So, um, are we good, sound? Can we go? Okay, let's go to the third one. The third one. Give me volume, give me volume, give me volume. a God-given talent. Yeah. I had a dream and the dream wasn't reality but I had a dream of playing with this playing this instrument with Kenny G. 
And uh, when I woke up, that was 11 years ago, I couldn't find the instrument around me, so I, I did one crazy stuff that time. I lied to my parents. I told them I need money for school fees. So when they gave me the money, I, I went and I bought this instrument. <laughs> but funny enough, the, the money I bought Please the you instrument... Uh, my name is uh, Major General Chris Eze, retired. I'm the immediate past uh, High Commissioner of Nigeria to India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. I was in the APC, but I came back, and uh, when I came back, I joined the Labour Party so that I would be part of uh, Peter B's transformation. Oh my God, that's really, really lovely. It's lovely to have you here today. So uh, concerning the events, you attended it, right? So how has it been so far? What would you have to say about it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's awesome. It is awesome. The, the content, the packaging, the kind of people that uh, were attracted uh, to this place, um, the intellectual content, you know, that was displayed here. I mean... To describe it is, uh, um, I, I lack words to describe it. And I think for me, I think the, the high point uh, was the, the poems that uh, the lady from ABU. Oh, yes, that was really interesting. So I think we have another Chimamanda DJ in the making. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. So for the uh, group, the Boys Champion Group, and what they are about, the initiative that uh, seeks to um, enlighten people, so what do you have to say about it? Uh, well, what I have to say about it is uh, just like uh, uh, what Cardinal Onaeko said, uh, that when he asked uh, why girls were not uh, included in the title boys champion, um, that uh, the answer he got was that the idea was to change the mindset of boys, because it is boys that... Uh, will grow up to be men and they are the people that will uh, reset the relationship between men and uh, women in our society. I, I want to say that uh, a lot of progress is already being made there uh, because you know for instance that uh, violence against women in households in families was accepted sometime in uh, not too long ago. And I began to doubt. But I now went and verified and saw his text. He says, is it possible to shoot it on here? He says, today, his verified hand, um, Twitter point. Today, I will be speaking to young Nigerians who are my partners in the journey to Nigeria's rebirth. And he placed the picture of this event on his Twitter handle. You can see it so that we can know. Just some moments ago, but it always shows that he is coming in shortly. Thank you for your patience. But then as we continue, it is not, it's not an endless affair. So when this young lady was giving us $10,000, some people went to their calculators and their phone and began to check. It's not fair now. It's not good. Just leave it at 10000 It's 10000 naira, eh? Ten thousand dollars, and they went to their phones and they got, I saw the, the calculator. Some people are even pressing contact instead of calculator, and they checked it. How much? I don't want to know. This is a round of applause for boys champions. Hey, I am also going to win next year. Ten thousand dollars. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another event, which. Is Christian just a moment? Okay, just before the event, let me just remind you guys about the Twitter thing. Can we make it trend? Can we make it trend? You know, we were told that we are change makers and we can influence the future and shape it today, right? So I want to see how powerful you are in making that change happen by making this event trend. Remember, the hashtag is shaping the future. Hashtag shaping the future retweet as much as you can share as much as you can particularly the live video that is streaming live on the handle boys champion on facebook and instagram as well as on twitter of course i'm standing here with me is the famous king sars the saxophonist of fat is a legend <laughs> it's nice to meet you yes thank you so much so how do you feel today 
Yeah, I feel very much excited being part of this Great Boys Champion Conference. It's, it's indeed an amazing day, very beautiful day, yeah, for real. It definitely is. So uh, we saw you, your performance in there and it was breathtaking. So let's just get a little information about you. How exactly did it start for you? Okay, um, for, you mean coming to this? No, no, not the conference now. Personally, yes. How did this, just briefly, how did it start for you? Okay, um... I, everything has been good all the way. Yeah, it's been good all the way. I didn't then. I didn't really put interest in it, but right now I see God moving in me through this instrument, and I'm excelling. I'm doing greatly. Yeah, God truly is moving in you. Okay, for the boys, a champions initiative and their desire to curb the violence, the gender-based violence. What is how exactly do you feel about the initiative? Um, for the boys, champion, and uh, I'm a. Everything, everything about today was looking actually to be sincere, strange to me. But I would say to those that are here, to the boys, to the young, and um, to the adults that are here as well too, because um, nobody is above learning. Yeah, knowledge is really so well. Yeah, okay, I'm going to take just one person from each line as quickly as possible, Briefly. so that we can go to the next item. I have you on this line. Is there anybody on that line? Okay, uh, a lady. I'm. Um, I don't know why I love to listen to ladies. <laughs> so please, I'll pass the mic to you, and then very briefly, if possible, in less than two minutes, what you are taking away from this conference and what you would love to see in this conference in the future. Good afternoon, everyone here. Yeah. I'm so happy to be here because I learned a lot. I came all the way from uh, Obola for Meanwhile, I'm teaching in CSS Obo Lake, and I'm happy that I'm here. First time that I saw the adverts, they said by school volunteer or personally. I did mine personally, and I'm amazed from what I saw here today. But please, boys champion, if you can talk this, all these things, if it's how possible that you can do, that you can take all these things that was taught to us here today to our rural villages. Like those people who are in the villages, they may not be opportune to be here today. And in the sense that they cannot even have as access to it in the online that we are said to be because to subscribe is a problem. At least in an average Nigerian today will be fighting to eat before getting a data to subscribe. And some of them, if they subscribe though, they will be using it for all sorts of manners of things that are not uh, as important as this one. So please, voice champion, if you can take this thing to rural communities, it will be very nice and I will be very glad because from the things that I see in school, I'm in a rural village teaching. From things that I'm seeing in school, if this kind of program can be organized in a rural community, bring them down to their understanding. Thank you. I think it will be very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank the lady you. says, my community is a rural village. It's okay. I come from where she is teaching. So, <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good my afternoon, name sir. is Samson Osoidage, the executive director and founder of Radio of Hope Foundation. You will all agree with me that Mr. Noel Alumona and his team has delivered excellence in this conference. And so I will appeal that we all give him a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone that has found time to be here, I think this is all worth our time. And I will appeal to Mr. Noel and his team that they make this an annual conference. And it shouldn't just be a conference for a day. It should be a conference that will take a day or two. We are hoping and praying that he will have more resources to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very it's much. A good so, one. Uh, after this, I'm going to come upstairs. Do we have comments from those on the gallery? Yeah, okay. I see some hands flying up. All right. Um, my name is Colin Sobona. Uh, I'm the creative director on Suka Chronicles. Actually, I happen to be a classmate of uh, Noel uh, Alumana, and uh, this is the first time my classmate is doing this kind of thing. And 
Um, it's wonderful and it's the best thing I've ever seen in my life because I've not been in this kind of gathering before. Yeah, where I have all the who is who in Africa conveyed with other persons to talk about Africa and African continent. It's wonderful and I'm amazed. And I have an observation. There are so many content creators all over the world. Uh, sorry, in Nigeria, in Igbo land, in Enugu State, Usoka. So while growing Usoka Chronicles, Usoka Chronicles is also a collective um, team of content creators from the village. Actually, we are going to the village, just like the other woman has spoken that we need to go to the village. The city people have benefited a lot, and it's time to take it to the village. Thank I you. Like, I like that. Let, just okay. before the other person speaks, okay. I must commend this young man. The reason is that your classmates may be your worst enemy sometimes when they are progressing. But here he is, expelling what's in his mind, honestly, diligently, and obediently, you understand. So give him a round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, being in the same arena with, you know, the who, 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 I was almost mentioning your title, who, who of Ubololan, Daka is Daka. Allow me to be in peace. <laughs> <laughs> being with who is who in Africa, you know, being in the same way with Mr. Frank Weke Jr. It's a good and, thing. And watching people just call him Frank is an amazing thing, trust me. <laughs> And then he, he sits there just relaxed and he's not, he's not angry about it. So Frank, Franco, <laughs> okay, I saw someone raise his hand from here. Who was the first person to raise their hand? Okay, let me take this comment from a secondary school student here. Yeah. Thank you very much, though I'm not a secondary school student. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm on the same uniform with my students. A round, of applause for him. a round of applause for him. A round of applause for him. That directional and purposeful. Daniel Ngene from the Good Shepherd Anglican Seminary here in Enugu. Indeed, I think this program started yesterday with the teachers, and that we are all saying the same thing. In fact, yesterday, if we would have released a communique, we would have asked the Ministry of Education and the PPSMB and what have you to review the curriculum we are using to teach so that it will all boils down to holistic education that has to do with visible learning, practical education per se. So, uh, but that is by the way. I want to thank the convener of this very program in fact, what I've been doing here is making sure that none of my students is sleeping from the inception. They have been awake? Uh, yes. All through? Of course. So that not only me listening, but for them who are yet to finish secondary school, hearing these things themselves will help them to change their perspective about life, just as certain things have made me to change mine. Uh, so that is by the way. And... Uh, I want to encourage we, the young generation, just as the speakers have said that we are in a better position. In fact, I want to borrow from His Eminence, Archbishop John and Icon, who said we have what it takes to go and push them out. Uh, please, uh, I don't want to say get your guns because it's not all about uh, physical confrontation. It's all about uh, mental strengthening and getting what it takes. So those of us who are on the side of educating the young Nigerians and myself on the pathway to good governance. We must be very, very sure that we are not part of those being used by the geriatrics to cause confusion in the society. In a, in a school, you would, yeah. So please, we <laughs> all have to make sure that we are not part of those being used by cause this confusion and by so doing, we will now think aright to better our own future. Thank, Thank you. you.
Well, thank you very much. Geriatrics. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if you belong to the geriatrics, Mr. I don't know what geriatrics <laughs> is. I have to Google. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I thought he was their senior prefect because the others didn't wear a suit on top. So he had a suit. So I thought he was the senior prefect. <laughs> but, but you now okay. know. He's I a know good teacher. teacher. Exactly. <laughs> <a> teacher. <laughs> Okay, so um, the video for um, uh, Onyeko Nguyen is ready. is ready now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to take that video right now. Please, let's uh, look at the screen. Let's take Thank you. the video. My name is Onyeka Nguyen I am an academic visitor at the African Studies Center, University of Oxford, uh, and also a visiting scholar at the Center for African Studies, in the University of Cambridge. Books. I'm an author of also made um, about six films. I'm interested in studies about African anthropology, studying the behaviors of people. I have a story to tell. When I was about seven years old, I was um, molested by a so-called nanny uh, that had been brought into our family to take care of us. She was more about using us as sex objects. She was a, an older woman, an older lady. But one day, my father found out and she was sent away. I had encountered this woman again and one question I asked her, why would you do what you did to me? She had no answer to that. Today she has her own children. What happens to her own children? What if someone else did that to her? In fighting abuse all over the world, we must look inwards. What are the stories of the young men? Some of us find it really interesting and particularly enamored by what had happened to us and we think we're strong enough because we are men. So we say, oh, didn't you enjoy it? Psychologically, that begins to take over your emotional feelings. Day-to-day -day activities of life without understanding where your trauma comes from. In studying African anthropology, in reading out in African studies, one must understand that the dynamics of living have to be taken into consideration. Young people need to read more. Young people need to experience life. And through experiences, we begin to unravel the mysteries of life. I think it's important to teach young people sex education from a very tender age. And also, also, I think it's important for history to be taught to young people in illustrations from the age of four. By then, we begin to understand how Africa can be fixed. I mean, I'm delighted to speak to people uh, who are younger than me and also older than me because nobody knows it all. But it's important that such gathering today has to happen all the time. And this is why I think Nelson has done incredibly well. But one must begin to understand that if you're going to have a child, you must have the time to raise your child and not let any other person raise that child for you. And this is why I think it's important to have plans for your children, for their future, for their life to be in a very shaped way. So I thank you for listening to me. That's a very impressional story from a man who said he was molested. Some of us may have gone through this, but his story is one that we should all remember that there could be better days ahead. Thank you very much for listening. 
Now, the noise you heard when this was being relayed was, as I was told, the noise of the chopper bringing in Mr. Peter Obi. Just hold on. Please, we want to make some arrangement before he comes in. Everybody must promise me you must be on your seats. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If you want to rise, hold on. If you want to rise to welcome him, you must rise and stay on your seat. We don't want him to be unnecessarily hassled up. So what I want you to do is give him all the noise, all the rousing welcome you can, but please stay where you are. Is it agreed? Ed? Somebody is not agreed. Ed? We have to sign an MOU. Please let it be agreed upon because we want to make sure we have him, but we are going to give him the rousing reception. The only person who is not a politician here is Professor. Uh, aha. <laughs> I didn't mention anybody's name, but when the is not in the but I want to also because I I want to align with uh, with uh, the Abga candidate for the governorship of Enugu State, Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. That all of us are politicians, and politicians everybody must be a politician so that we can get to the root of our problems. I was even thinking maybe I should be talking about it now. I was thinking that maybe because you come from a different background of the United States education sector. You may not understand why we say we are we should be politicians because the major decisions taken in our country today are taken by politicians how you drive through the town whatever you do and so on they are all determined by those we elect so you are a politician as long as you are here in nigeria okay thank you very much once again DJ, please give us a slight number so that I can rest my voice. Thank you. Square and uh, a moment or two, 
our expected honored guest will be here. Now, somebody was asking, how would I join Boys Champions to shape the future? I think I should go to Noel Alumana to answer the question. Please come and answer the question to them. Me, I would also like to join Boys, because I'm a Boys. <laughs> Hello! I wish, I wish you all know how I feel this evening. I've never felt like this in a while. You know? Thank you. We started planning this event like since last year. Since last year. So you can imagine the, the efforts that we put into it. You know, inviting all the people that we invited and, you know, everything that happened towards the end because of security, some people could not come in and all that. So, but um, the question is how can you be part of what we do? First and foremost, our organization is volunteer driven. So we work with volunteers. You can see them scattered all over the place wearing our t-shirts. So those are our volunteers. You can go to our website at www.boyschampions.org slash volunteer. So you can sign up to volunteer with us. We have different opportunities. Um, in a couple of weeks time, for instance, we're gonna host a boot camp for all our volunteers. Woo! So I think I will reserve this information. Okay. So let us continue with what we were saying. I am so happy because all our efforts, all our efforts was never in vain. I am so happy that I am so happy that Once again, 
I want you to rise and welcome Mr. Peter Obi. Then, we, we, we you know the, the days are difficult for him. And we are to so take your seats. Take your seats. The rock, I welcome you, sir. We are not going to go into frivolities and niceties. But I want, I want to request that the, the man of the moment, Mr. Peter Obi, will now come up stage to address us now. A round of applause for him. Please take him. I want the cameraman to get me as I'm shaking his hand. It's not easy. You know what I mean? Mr. Peter Obi, welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, there is. In your world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me very respectfully stand on all you and existing protocol, but I have to. I have, I have some brothers here that I must recognize. I don't know. Let me start with my the organizer of this event. I thank you most sincerely. And I thank my brother, the former minister. Brother Frank Mweke, I thank Valo Zibo, all the dignitaries that are here in front. If I don't remember, just know that all of you are VIPs and dignitaries. The reason why it looks as if I was hurrying to talk is not because I have somewhere I'm rushing. Yes, I'm going back to Lagos. But what is most important is for me to most sincerely, sincerely, apologize to all of you. I am very, very sorry to have kept you all this while. No. It's not good to do this type of thing. I can tell you it's been a very difficult day in the sense that I had a few classes. I had to be in Calabar. I had to be in Baeza and I had to be here. And of course, everywhere you go, you have to attend to everything and all that. And I have to be in Lagos for an event tonight. So I have to run to Lagos. But, you know, that is the, let me tell you, uh, like I told the people in Calabar when I said to them, I'm going to leave. They were feeling, I said, well, listen, I'm looking for a job. And I have to see all the owners of the country. You know, when you're looking for a job, you have to go to the people who own the company, who own the place. You are the owners. So I'm looking for a job. So I have to see you. And you don't apply to job through surrogate. You come personally. Because they want to listen to you personally. So let me thank you. I know that we must have a topic for today. Shaping the future. Okay. I think I don't need to tell you anything about the future. All I can tell you is that if you look at Nigeria today, your country, first is that the people I see here is the future. You are the future. But that future, nobody can build it for you, except you. You must take control of it. So what you are about to do now is to hire the CEO for your future. And unless you hear that CEO, you're going to get it wrong. You live in a country today where you don't have faith. I can assure you, if they say to you today, how many of you want to leave this country? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Don't be shy of saying that. The things that I tell people, there's nobody who wants to live where there's war. Nobody lives where what drives people having faith because they don't have faith. What drives people having faith is hope. If we go to church on a Sunday and the priest says there's no heaven, 
What do you think will happen? Everybody will go home. Nobody stays where there's no hope. There must be what drives the people's future is hope. And the reason why you want to live here is because you don't have hope. Nobody. Nobody knowingly goes to where there's a problem. Go to your house, you see ants. Ants. This is animal moving. You put fire here, they'll turn. So even the animal, the ants don't want trouble. If you put sugar, they'll come. But if you put fire, you see them, they turn away. Because they don't want trouble. They want sweet. That sweet is their hope. And once they dictate it, one will come, the rest will follow him. That's how you attract foreign investment. Your country today is going through trouble times. It's qualified for two things that makes the failed state. When you're no longer in control of your territory, everybody's insecure here, including you. You're nobody safe. Nobody knows. The only thing you hear now is bad news. Number two is when you're no longer in control of your economy. Your parents, yourself, you're having a problem. You don't have a job. It is difficult for you to know where the next meal will come from. Your parents no longer know what they're going to spend for a bag of rice today or a bag of beans. If they send somebody to the market, when it comes back, whatever it comes back, that is the price of for it for that day. You can't plan with that. So you must change. Why did we arrive here? This is cumulative effect of bad leadership over the years. It is one person can do good Frank has been in government when they strive hard to cancel our debts. So we are not owing by the time they left. Today, from a position where our foreign and domestic debts was less than $10 billion when they left, they cleaned out our side ones. Today, our total debt is over 100 and 30 billion dollars and nobody can show anything for it you know what it means for you that you get up in the morning you've given him money has been borrowed nobody no new furniture no new this everybody's telling story that is the state of their country we're not in a mess the consequence is that within the time they left office and town we moved unemployment of about less than 15% to about 35%. So you have doubled your unemployment. And you doubled your poverty. And you have crisis. If you don't know where the next bill is coming come from, you are dangerous. And it's not because of anything. If you lock all of us up here now for four days, everybody is looking for food. Nobody knows who will do anything wrong. I will be looking for food. We will be looking for food. If it gets longer, we might eat each other. It's simple. So you double the poverty. People no longer have job. They don't have anything. You have 35% unemployment. With youth unemployment of almost 60%. Young people in their productive age, with full energy, with talent, no job. It's a crisis for any country of the world. Not just Nigeria. And that's what you're facing too. You have 20 million on them out of school children. You have all sorts of things going on. I don't want to tell you about what is wrong. Because you know what is wrong. Because it affects you every day. What you want to hear now is how do we start getting out of here? Because it's no longer what, you know, I had an uncle years back. So that's why you say you know everything. My uncle was arrested in the village and they put handcuffs in his hand. And they were going away. Everybody who told him in the village and said, Okay, what is wrong? He said, There's nothing wrong. Okay, what is wrong? There's nothing wrong. And they called me and said, Okay, they've arrested Okoye. We don't know why they came to the village and took him, blah, blah, blah. But it was a handcuff. 
Akko is uh, is always causing one problem or other. He has insulted the police, uh, deputy DPO, blah blah. So I called Okoye. I called him. I said, Ah, you went to his house and this happened. Leave Okoye now. You know that is. I said, but the man is always. I said, leave him. So they left him. So I came to the village and I asked him. This man saw you. He told him there's no problem. This man saw. He just says, Oh, he caused all of them. He called this one. He said, You are a very stupid man. God will punish you. This one is. He said, They are stupid. They saw trouble in my hand and they asked me about trouble. <laughs> because there's trouble in his hand already. So why I asked him whether there's trouble? Trouble is there now because he's a off. So all of you know the trouble. What are we going to do to do this? Next year's election. We must elect people who are competent. Yes. Eighteen of us. Eighteen of us is going to tell you the same problem. Eighteen of us will tell you the same thing. Nobody is going to tell you. We are going to tell you sweet things. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to do that. None of us will promise everything that is good. My dear people. The question is that you must verify the 18 of us. It is now time to listen and say, next year's election, from president to the last person, you must verify it. We have no room for experiment again. It is not going to be based on party. It's going to be based on person. We're not going to talk about structure. The structure you hear people talk about today is structure of criminality. Structure of destruction. Structure that brought us to this junction. That's what we want to remove. We want to remove that structure and put in a structure of development. We will offer what we're going to do. What do you need to do? First, is that you, a government must focus on fighting and dealing with issue of security of life and property. Nigerians must be secured. If you secure Nigeria today, in Enugu and everything, you get the farmers to go back to the farm. And when they go back to the farm, you bring down food inflation. So we start seeing food prices at affordable price. Food inflation will come down, things will start changing. How are you going to do it? You need to uh, scale up the manpower in your police, in your army, your navy. Whole agencies are lowly manned. We have 370,000 police people, but the IG told me is about 320. If you remove about 70,000 and following people like me around, it is down to 250. For a country of 270 million people, it cannot work. Egypt is 100 million. And they have about a million police. So you need to upscale that. By that, you're creating job, you're creating everything, they must secure the place. And the, world, the remaining ones are poorly equipped. Only half have guns. We must equip them. We must employ them. We must increase our manpower, security manpower, employ them and equip them. When you do that, Simultaneously as you are doing it, you are tackling moving Nigeria from consumption to production. Once the country is productive, you will start pulling people out of poverty. The more you pull people out of poverty, the more people have means of livelihood, the more you reduce criminality. Nobody wants to go and commit problem, be in jail if he finds food to eat. You must invest in the youth. That is the future of Nigeria. 
we must invest in you, we must put money in your hands. Because you have the energy and the talent to develop new companies. Every country of the world is dealing the, the base, the engine of growth in any country of the world is what you call micro small enterprises, which is you. We must invest in you. That is the future. Anything short of that, we are wasting everybody's time. So we must. And how do you start it? We will think about feeding ourselves. Nigeria must feed itself. We can no longer continue to be dependent on this. And feeding ourselves means that people will invest in agriculture and everything. Nigeria today is not feeding itself. A country of 220 million people, if India at 1.4 billion can feed itself, Nigeria for 220 million can feed itself. We have more farmland than India. India is 1.4 billion people living on 3.2 million square kilometers of land. We are 220 living on 923,000 square kilometers, which means we live on a third of Indian land and we are one seventh of their population. So we, there's no way we have more land space than India. So if we have more land space than India, we have more to cultivate, to feed ourselves. You go to Enugu State alone. All those lands, in Uzu one and everything, eh? No. Go, I'm not talking about the Enugu State, Enugu capital. Go to Uzu one. Go to Nsuka. I fly around. We have enough land to cultivate things in Enugu, to feed ourselves. Most of the land in Nigeria, over 50 percent of the arable land in Nigeria is not cultivated, and we can't find food. No country in the world, no country in the world can do that because we are consuming country. All everybody wants is where to share, where to make easy money. Those countries you want to go to, there's no free lunch. You have to work, but you'll be paid. That's what we want to do. So we must feed ourselves. If we feed ourselves today, the story will be different. Frank knows our GDP today is about 180 trillion naira, and agriculture is the highest. Yeah, we're not feeding ourselves. It's about 41 trillion, which is about 20 something percent. If we feed ourselves, you double that. You double, it will be about 80. And you're increasing the GDP of the country. That's where we will start. With that, you start processing, you steal everything. Today, when we talk about criminality, people in government is still our oil. None of you here can steal oil. Let nobody tell you. Those who are stealing oil are people in government. You don't steal oil. It's not something you put in your pocket. I have this sweet in my pocket. I can go to ShopRite and steal it. This is not oil. Oil, you have to come with a tank. And the tanker cannot come into Nigeria without Navy. And he won't go out without Navy. So somebody approved for it to be taken. So you must deal with that. We will stop that. People, people are telling you today there's something they call subsidy. And when they want to remove it, they make you riot. Subsidy is an organized crime. The amount of money we consume, the oil we consume, we cannot consume that quantity of oil for our population. Pakistan is the same population as us, 215, 220. But they consume less than 50% of what we consume. So for me, from day one, I'm going to replace those who are drinking the extra and give them water.
Because we need it. We need to deal with every penny. We need to bring our back our money. We need to take back our money. I want to invest that money in you. We cannot have, we cannot spend six, five, six trillion annually, annually for subsidy and spend 50% of that. We spend more money in subsidy than we spend in education or health. Do any of you have car? Maybe one or two. So, so what is subsidy to you? It doesn't bother you. They say, oh, the price of transport will go up. It's not true. We will ensure that we do local refining. Then Gote will soon be ready. There's other modular refineries and other people. The even people, they say they are doing it illegally. I'll call them and say, you don't need to do it illegally. Let's do it illegally. It's simple. We will change that. That is what the future we want to bring. The future we want to bring is a future that will give you hope. We will change that by making the country productive because the time investment, people are saying, how are you talking about being productive? To show you that your country is not productive, I'm going to give you three examples, two using states and one using your nation. Alambra state, Enugu state, everybody is waiting to share from all here. All the states in the north with the vast land. The biggest state in Nigeria, the largest state is Niger state. Niger state have a fertile land that can feed Nigeria. Niger state is 76.3 thousand square kilometers of land. Then, Niger state, Niger state can feed Nigeria. But they are waiting for the territory allocation. Niger state is fertile land. Eight local governments, about seven to eight local governments, in, under the control of bandits. They can't feed themselves. They can't do anything. Netherlands without water. It's at 30,000 square kilometers of land. So Niger State is two and a half times Netherlands. Netherlands last year did export of agricultural products $103 billion. 120 billion, oh sorry, 103 billion euros, 103 billion euros, 120 billion dollars. That means Netherlands last year No, don't worry. Don't worry, it's not about you. Somebody is very fine. <laughs> no, no, it's not about you. They have the pilots that brought me here. If they wait for an extra ten minutes, if they wait for an extra ten minutes, they won't be able to fly out of Enugu. Because I come with a chopper. But I can't leave you. I'd rather go to the airport and take this and let them go. So just wait. So what is this? Is? So Niger State, if Niger State was able to do 1%, 1%, why just 1%? I did say 2%. 1%. If they were able to do 1% of what? 1%. I didn't say 2. 1% of what Netherlands did, they would be, they would be earn $1.2 billion. Just 1%. They have two and a half times the land. I'm asking them to just 1%. 1% would have given them 2 point one point two billion dollars at six hundred and fifty naira per dollar is about seven hundred and fifty billion dollars 
That is about four times, five times their budget. But they are waiting to share for more year money, which can give them maximum of 50 billion per annum. The same is other state I'm going to use in the entire state in North Central. But it is another state, not East. A million states. Taraba. Taraba state is bigger than Belgium and Israel combined. Taraba state is 54.4 thousand square kilometers of land. Belgium is 30.9. Israel is 22.1. Both of them are 53. Taraba State is 54.4. But Taraba State cannot feed itself. He's waiting to share money from this. Taraba State is on, on plains of Mandela. So he can grow flour, coffee, and tea. I went to India. Sorry. Let me leave India. I went to Kenya. If you go to Kenya, I went to the fields. Kenya did the export of over half a billion dollars of flour last year. Flour. What is sophisticated in flour? If you go there when they are doing Valentine, the amount of flies that are coming to carry flour away, you said, what are we doing here? I'm so young girls and young boys who are not graduates plucking and packing flour. They were being paid $100. And we're in this country, we're not doing anything. They are waiting for the reallocation. Ethiopia, an African country, did a spot of about 1.1 billion dollars in coffee. We are waiting for statutory allocation. Sierra Lanka, with all their trouble, exported 1.4 billion worth of tea. If you combine all this can grow in Taraba. But they are waiting for statutory allocation. It cannot continue. Your entire country is about 220 million people, like I said earlier, living on 923,000 square kilometers of land. The total export of Nigeria last year is 18.9 trillion naira. If you divide it by 650, is under 30 billion. Government has divided by 410, so it's 47 billion dollars. I divided by 650, is under 30. Compare that with a Viet the country, other developing country, Vietnam. They live on 331,000 square kilometers of land. So they live on one third of our land, and they have 100 million, half of our population. Their export last year is over 350 billion dollars. So we couldn't do 10% of what they did. That is why you have a problem with your dollar exchange. Because what is, where, how, do you, how do you stabilize your currency? By your reserve. What drives your reserve? Your export. If you have nothing to sell, you have, you have nothing now. You have, you're just there. We have nothing to sell. The oil that used to give us the dollar, they are still in it. We are the only... So, what are you doing? You need to make the country productive. It is what we are begging you. Next year's election is an existential election. It's an election that will say the country will exist or it will not exist because it will collapse. Give all these people are telling you. And that's why I'm begging people. That is your future. Your future is tied to next year's election. Your future is electing people who have what it takes to. This vehicle needs a competent driver. Because that, I mean, those who drove it, drove it have knocked the engine. <laughs> so we need people who fix it. We need to hire mechanics that will fix it and drive it. Otherwise, you have a problem. If you allow it, the way it is today, it will consume everybody. 
and we are begging you you can't shape the future what will shape the future of nigeria is competent leadership who understands what development is all about who knows that development is measured on hdi i can start investing in that in health in education and per capita pulling people out of poverty and it must be clear i was in a meeting the other day and so it seemed good of editors the other day some of you will see it and somebody said peter with all these things that you have these ideas you have supposing if you don't win and somebody else wins and wants to work with you what will you do? I said, that is the problem of Nigeria. You want to hire a conductor and then sit driver sit at the back and be working with the driver. Then the motor will have an accident and keep on driver and conductor. The driver must be competent. It must be a qualified driver. We can no longer sit where we manage. We're not going to manage. Because we will lost it. Countries have overtaken us. I was with the Canadian ambassador two days ago. And I said to him, you don't know how I feel that in Nigeria applies for visa for Canada. He has to go to Kenya. We are giant of Africa. I went to see another ambassador. He told me he invite me for G20 as observer. I said, I won't come. I will be a member. I will drive the country to be a member. There's nothing that makes... If you hear, any day you hear G7, G20, G anything, it's economy. If your economy and is up and running, they put in one G. Or you become g -less. That is the future I want to drive the country to. And that's what we are talking. So next year's election, please... Do not vote for anybody based on tribe. Listen to all of us. Don't vote for anybody based on tribe. I'm from the Southeast. I'm an Igbo man. I'm not running this election based on tribe. I don't want anybody to vote for me. No sentiment. I'm a Nigerian. And I'm running as a Nigerian. I'm running. So, not try buy bread cheaper. Not in the north, not in the east. There's no road they turned here and said it's for Igbo people. Any one shall road is bad. Any group of that is bad. Kadunak Abuja is bad. Everywhere north is bad. Southwest road is southeast. Uh, east West Road is bad. Kalaba to Uyo is bad. Everywhere is bad. So Lagos is bad. No pass. So I want to. There's no place they built road that was so good, and they say it's for this tribe. Show me which tribe have uninterrupted electricity. So it's not a tribal thing. This is ethnic manipulation to keep our country down. No tribe. It will not be about religion. Let nobody tell you it's about Christian or Muslim. No, 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 no. Forget about what they're doing. Nobody should tell you that. I'm a Christian. Christians don't buy bread cheaper. They cannot go to the market and say, I'm a Christian. You buy rice cheaper. The bag is the same thing. For Muslims, for Christians, for everybody. It's only in this country that they tell you that story. I live everywhere in the world where Muslims are. The central mosque in London is built on the best piece of land in central London. The queen donated the land free. He's not a Muslim. And it's cost millions of pounds. The Kali church in Dubai bought the land and the church is built by Emir of Dubai. Is a Muslim. I go there. If you go there, this church was built by Amy of Dubai. So let nobody tell you it is not a religious issue. The North is poorer. They have been in power. They are more insecure. They have been in power. So let nobody tell you 
whether it's in Enugu, whether it's in Abba, whether it's everywhere, Nigeria is collapsing. Nobody should tell you we're in power, we're in charge. So please, do not listen to any of us who behave as if we are God. You see somebody today say, I'm the one who is going to determine who is going to be local government chairman, governor, or president. You're not God. God created all of us. There's nothing that made me any better or any different than any of you here. Whatever I've achieved, whatever I have, is by His grace. There's nothing different. And you cannot abuse grace. So anybody who comes out and says, I will determine who will come here, is not God. Tell him that he's not God. That is why I'm running. I want to be president. I'm applying for the job. That's why I'm here. I'm here. Let everybody who wants to do the same thing come here and explain to you. Not, not if you are. Not if you are. Somebody. No representative. I told them in Kalamana, no representative. It's only Nigeria you're starting for election. You're looking for a job. They say, ah, why can't his postman speak for him? When Obama was on, this is postman. It's only in Nigeria. You are telling what I'm saying now. Why? Tomorrow, it's all okay. You're not doing what you said. Not tomorrow, when you say, I say, hey, it wasn't me. It was Mr. Zibo who told you. No, no, no. I'm the one applying for the job. You are the owner of the company. So the applicant must appear before the owners. Not to fear anybody. If I have my time, I will visit every university. I want to go and tell them what I'm going to do. I want to tell them that university will not be closed under me. Because that is what is going to happen. So you have to go to them. You cannot go and stay. They are my stay. Well, I say, ah, it's my, it's my turn. No way. It is turn of Nigerians youth to take back their country. And you must take it back. That's what we want to do. Whoever you give it now will know it was elected by the people. That is why I'm running. That's why I don't care about what anybody says, oh, these people are too big. We are all applying for a job. Big man, small man. The owners of the company will say who they will employ. So don't stay in your house and say, I am qualified. I'm this, I'm that. We put you there before. You stole our money. And you want to use it to intimidate us? No way. <laughs> Next year's election will be based on character we can trust. Yes. So if PWB says, I will fight corruption. And I'll fight it. Because corruption kills three things that makes a society. It kills entrepreneurship. It kills professionalism. And it kills how to work. So you must stop it. If I say I'm going to do it, I'm there, go to Anambra State. I was governor there. If you go there and their money is missing, hold me responsible. And when you talk about corruption, corruption is abuse of, you measure corruption, corruption index. Perception index is measured on management of public assets. So if you were a governor, local government, chairman, or president, how did you manage the assets of the country? That includes nepotism. How many of the nations did you give job? How many of them had job? So you can go to Anambra State and ask them, whether Peter B's chief of staff, commissioning commissioner, was from his village. 
Not one. You can ask them, include how you manage the land and the resources of the state. You can go to Alhambra State. If you see any piece of land allocated to Peter, directly or indirectly, come and stop running. I have a case. I have a case of war where my housing person in charge of our housing authority gave me land and I told him no. So I can tell you then the day I left office I was not owing people can doubt anything. I was not owing one any pension to any civil listen to me to any civil servant I was not owing salary to any civil servant I was not owing gratuity to any civil servant no contractor I didn't say no contractor who gave job who was not being owed no contractor who has executed his job certificate issued as being owed I know I repeat no supplier who has supplied goods was not paid. And as of that day I left, Nigeria was being measured based on HDI and NDG. I was number one. And you can go and check. We moved our education from number 26 to number one. I heard was working and everything. I didn't feel really doing anything, you know. There seems to remain because government is a continuum. But the day they are left, if you go to a certain day, if you walk and till date, the banks are still in Nigeria, your relations are working here, they know if you go to Access Bank, managed by then by Aki Moko de Formedo State as managing director, I have 50 million dollars, 10 billion naira for an state. If you go to Diamond Bank, managed by Alex Oti, then I have 50 million dollars, 10 billion naira for an state. If you go to Fidelity Bank, managed by Nando Konkwo, I have 50 million dollars, 10 billion naira for an state. My speaker then brought a law for me which he wants me to sign that I should be paid allowance, severance, they have to build a house for me in Oka, build a house for me in Abuja, and pay me certain amount and I say, Mr. Speaker, I'm done. I'm going home to my children. Anambra said I never bought me pure water. Not go to Anambra State. They've never bought me a bottle of water since I left nine years ago. I've never gone there. I don't own any land in Oka. I don't have a house in Oka. Where I was coming now, I told them that the present governor of Bachu State saw me about a month ago. He said, you're the only governor I gave land in Abuja that haven't developed his own. And I said, I don't need a land house in Abuja. I manage my headache and my problems peacefully. The more of these things you owe, the more headache, the more problem you put in your head. So I want to, it's all health problem issue. People think that owing a lot is also, is also a health challenge. Because people will be selling you no generator, no design. So for me, I left them and go home. What am I saying? Character you can trust. So go and verify. The person who wants to be your president must be competent. He must understand the issues and be able to explain to you. Don't listen to these people who tell you, hey, they have a, a fantastic written manifesto. No. Anybody can, anybody can go and package it and write and circulate to you. And when 90% of your leaders don't know what, have, what is written in documents they are moving around. <laughs> you must have the capacity. You must have the capacity. 
You must have the commitment. You must have the commitment to be able to drive the proper pro That's how societies are moved. This job requires physical and mental energy. It is not something waste time. It's something you have to know. I was in Oka yesterday. I was I spoke in Oka. I spoke in Enugu yesterday. As of you know, where they have Christian Council in Transekulu. I spoke in Oware. And I spoke at Benin. Today I've been to Calabar, Bias, and I'm here and I'm going to Lagos. It requires physical and mental energy. Don't go and it is not something you manage. We need to do it. Because where Nigeria is now, you need to work 30 hours or 24 hours a day to pull it out of the brinks. My dear people, you have no other country. Your future is next year's election. So then let nobody tell you shaping your future. I've only wanted to shape those who drive this vehicle. Hire the proper drivers first so you can sit down don't hire these people who don't know where they're going. If you don't know where you're going, every road will lead you there. That's how Nigeria is now. Turn left is good. Turn right is good. Even, if, even worse that you have people who could not even tell you when things are bad or good. So they are dumb, they are deaf. So it is important. The future is in your hands. The people you hire is your future. And it's critical. If you do the wrong thing, the future will take revenge on you. God bless you. We invite Noel Alamona to present the award to him before he leaves the stage. Please. Okay, he wants to take a question or two. From people who can ask the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me ask this lady. The same lady first. My president. I'm sorry. My name is Chibua of Acetonia. I have a worry. We've been here for a long time. Actually, we started last uh, yesterday. We've been bombarded, the energy, why we should vote. I mean, it's awesome. I don't know what to tell you, Noah. God bless you. My worry now is, why is it difficult? We are the ones bringing you in. The power lies with us. We elect you to work for us, and you are there. Why is it difficult in Nigeria to now say, you are not doing the right thing, please leave? Why is it difficult? We take... We we'll take another question from the, from the back. Let me. Ask. Sorry. I can five. Okay. My name is Ike Chukugwai. Uh, my question, sir, Mr. President, the incoming president, is please, we want to see actually like an input. Can we see more of this in the northern part of Nigeria? more of your engagement with the northern 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 youths the final one from this side okay i think you want to ask koku mr president i greet you sir Please, my question goes like this. Why is it, I was wondering, I was coming back on Thursday from um, Lagos, from Lagos, Ojota, where I entered a vehicle to Delta State was double lane highway. But I entered from I am right to Enugu or Shingu lane. And I was asking this question, why is it different that in Igbo, the Igbo leaders are not functional like what I see in other places? Why is the highway all the way from Heart Bridge was single lane highway 
to a boy state. And there was a fatal accident that happened that last month that consumed the whole passengers. Nobody survived. A shipping trailer crushed the bus because of one lane until Dave Omaye was doing our double lane. Another lane from Lagos to Jetta State was double lane high lane. As I'm still speaking now, my mom called me that I should not come back to a Hamufi Susan that full and is slaughtering people now. I should not enter vehicle today and tomorrow. And we have leaders and are not doing anything. Thank you, sir. I think you can take the question, sir. Let me answer this today. Well, let me be honest with you. The last speaker, it will be difficult for me to answer that question. What I told you is the people you hire is a problem. These are things that will inform you to hire well. Because if your governor is sure that he was elected, you elected them, they will be able to push. When I was governor, head bridge on each other. When I was governor, you can't pass the on each head bridge. If you pass on each head bridge, you can't go anywhere. It was a mess. And I recall going to President Thomas and John and saying, Sir, I want to do 10 lane for head bridge to upper work. He asked me, what are, you, what are you talking? I said, yes. I want to do two lane on the Askers, two lane here, and do three, three in between. What I want federal government to do for me, so I want the contract, allow me to pay and they refund me. And my brother, I was in that road for head bridge I was in that road for head bridge Omonia when I left government and they were refunding an Ambra state the rest is I can't say for other people the people you elect is important the person who told me about engaging more in the north I thank you you know I didn't just come here that's why I said let me see your question I didn't come here just to talk to you. I also came to learn leadership, learning and listening are inseparable. If you can't learn and you can't listen and you can't learn, you shouldn't lead. Anybody who cannot do these two things should not lead. It's like a man who knows everything. If anybody knows everything, don't ever allow him to lead. He's an idiot. <laughs> so I've listened to you and I assure you. I will make it happen. <laughs> Madam, we can make people go. What we do here is that we celebrate criminality. Everybody here is worried now about who will be governor, who will be this. Peter will be becomes governor. In my village, when I became governor, everybody knew I did not have a house. My village. Thank you. It will shock you that when I wanted to contest the election, the first thing they told me is that I must come and build a house in my village. They said, you don't have a house. How can we vote for you to be a governor when you don't have a house in the village? I didn't say I want to build a house. I said I want to be governor. It has nothing to do with the building. And I want to be that it's governor. When I was governor, everybody comes to me in Oka. Hey, this man, look at the house in his village. Look at the house in Kaa. How can he be governor? You don't have a house in your village. You don't, hey, this thing is not this thing. People are laughing at you. Hey, who told those people to laugh? Am I a comedian? No. I'm doing, I was elected to do a job, not to build a house. I'm sure my sister, till today you know I don't have a house in my village. My mother built one. Two bedroom flat that stay there, the same banana I'm there. And it suits me. The people who want to live in mansion, it suits them. It doesn't conflict with my interests. I'm not a poor man. No. I'm a very comfortable man. I've made money, I'm rich, but I don't want there's nothing there. The, the two bedroom is okay. I can sleep in it and wake up in the morning. The people that are living around me don't even have mansion. I have friends who build long tennis swimming pool in the village. 
People have not eaten. Why are you building this in the village? Is it when your relations come, you're swimming? When they have all the problems in the world? I have friends who build very lovely, very lovely house. Furnish it with white seats. When the, when the village has come, they're saying, that you can't sit here, you can't sit Why are you telling them? Why don't you buy the, the type that is there and put it in the seat you sit? That's where I'm living with them. No quarrel. I'm not happy with them. They want to see me always. So, you can't. It is us that will ask them. What am I saying? If they vote me in, I steal their money, build their house, call bishop, call everybody, and build house warming, house opening, they will come. Bishop will be preaching. Whoever I got the money, let God double it. <laughs> the people are singing. Everybody says, in other countries, they call police. Because they know where it came from. You've stolen their money. Here they celebrate you. I don't want that type of life. My dear people, I have a flight to catch by six. That's what they are wanting me. But let me assure you that I remain in this race. I'm committed to Nigeria. And I'll say to the Nigerian youth, hold me responsible. I'll change this country. I'll assure you of my commitment. I'm not joking about it. We will make it work. You'll be proud. We have Nigerians. We have a Nigeria, but we don't have Nigerians. I want to build Nigerians. We'll be happy. I was telling somebody yesterday, we are watching World Cup from our home. 220 million people. The entire African country that qualified for World Cup, all of them put together, is about 130 million. And we, we only is 220. And we cannot make it. Never. If that if I'm voted in for 2023, we'll start planning the next World Cup. <laughs> we cannot do this anything. We are giants and we'll be giants. If you want to give us this, you come here. We'll make our schools work. We're not gonna to go to school in Ghana or Kenya. They will come here because we are giants. Giant was behave as giant, or you resign and call yourself something else. That's what I want to do. Thank you, thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. There will be... Hold on, please, hold on. Hold on. We want to do two things before we leave, and it will be sharp, sharp. So, um, what we are going to do... So, the Future Shapers Award. I'm going to reject this one. I said it before. Every award will come after office. Not when you are starting. So we know whether you perform and you meditate We're it. You for the past, not no, no, no. Don't want worry. I'm looking for a job now. What do you do for me now? <laughs> Pray for me. Pray for me. Campaign for me. When I finish, I'll come back. You see this thing? Don't think if I become president, I won't come here again. No. This That's when I'll come to answer my sister who said they'll put me out of job. When I become president, go and write it. We'll say come back because it's you. That made it possible. I have to come back and answer you. When I now finish, I take a word. But I'm very, very happy with this young man, with what he's doing, and I assure you, you have my number. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to work with you. I'm not going away. Thank you and God bless you. Pictures, pictures with the organizers. Bring pictures with the organizers. The organizers, please come. The organizers, please go to the, uh, the other pictures with the organizers quickly. Change the background picture. The organizers, please. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Not everybody. And panelists, panelists. Maybe I should also take this opportunity to stand with take picture. You understand what I mean? The panelists now. The panelists only. Nanga want my wife, and I'm gonna do this in photo that. Up, all the panelists, please. Vaughn, the panelists. The moderator. I would like to announce that the governor of Enugu State sends the SBA on diaspora, Mrs. Olangwa, as a here 
and we thank you for coming. Thank you very much, man, for coming. God bless you. Thank you. The organizers, the organizers, now, I'm going to ask you to put this to the song. Thank you very much. One half of another. Go and verify. Whether you like it or not, go and uh, whether you like it or not, go and uh, go and Okay. Are you happy you came here? Yeah. Are you living? We have no clothes on. No? Yeah. Have you seen me? Yeah. You have seen me, Toby. Have you seen me? Because I'm not running for president. Okay, so what do you want next? Have you forgotten we know the give? Yeah. Okay. So please, before you leave, if you if you are making if you are making your way out when that's when you are leaving you take a look at the left side of that exit point there's a 360 photo booth there on top of it you stand and then it spins you 360 it's a beautiful thing you might want to just experience so please ensure as many of you as possible that want to do it thank you and then all the volunteers we need you back on stage all the volunteers, we need you on stage for a general photograph. And after the volunteers, all of you who came here today would like to also have you on stage for a uh, group photograph. Don't forget to tweet these things. Make it go viral because today we have finally shaped the future. So volunteers, please come on stage. I think, if I, before you think, sir, did he do an amazing job today? Yeah. If you love the job you did, give him a rousing applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm grateful. Okay, okay, just before the photos. Well, there are people who have some kids for you. I hope you won't reject it like Peter will be. <laughs> so please, we have some things to give you. Don't oh my God. You. Portraits, and I hope you are not going to reject it, yes. <laughs> Portrait. Put your hands together. Come, 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 come and take a photo with him. Come, come, come. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who said, where's the official photographers? They have followed Peter Obi to Abuja. <laughs> Where are they? The official photographers, we need you now, please. Nah, yeah. Picture where I'm at. There's another one. <laughs> There's another one. Okay, so these guys love what you're doing and they just want to do the portraits with you. I the will... photographers, where are you? We need you. Proto. The official photographers, we need you. Okay, she's coming, she's coming. I want to join all members of Boys Champions to wish Noel Alumona and Dr. Chinenye Gochuku, Uzochuku, the best of days in the next few days as they celebrate their traditional wedding somewhere in Nigeria. Please give them a round of applause and prayers later for their success of their marriage. God bless you. Okay, so just in case you didn't notice the beautiful wife, she's the one sitting in front, right? So please stand yes. and see you. She's tall, just like Michelle Obama. Please put your hands together for her. Put your hands together for her. So someday, if you find decides to run for president, you'll be a future first lady. We would like to have a fine first lady like you in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so beautiful people. We want to say thank you for being here today. It's been an amazing time out for coming here. Thank you very much. To so all the panelists, you did fantastically well. Thank you, everyone, for all that you put into this to make it work. We love you. Together, we will keep shaping the future and make life and our country better than it is presently. Many thanks to all the organizers. Oembo, you put in a lot of work for this, so let me recognize you. My friend Henry, I see you. Tracy Dominic, I see you. And the rest of the crew, thank you. God bless you. God bless all of you.